give people a minute to connect. Oh. Hello? Yes, okay, we'll get started. If you're not um, speaking, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, um, welcome to the Tuesday, October 12th, 2021 meeting of the Evanston Preservation Commission. Um, as the first matter of business, uh, we have to suspend the um, rules in order to permit um, virtual participation in the meeting by the commissioners and the public. Um, would a commissioner like to make a motion to um, waive in-person presentation? I move that we waive the in-person presentations. Um, a second? I'll second that. Um, a, a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Bodan. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Driller. Aye. And I'm an aye. Um, thank you. Um, as a first um, order of business, um, I just uh, wanted to, to take the opportunity to publicly congratulate Commissioner Cohen, who is receiving um, the AIA Chicago's Lifetime Achievement Award for 2021 on um, Friday. And um, anybody who wants to participate can um, get the link, I think, off the AIA Chicago website. But it's an incredible honor. Stewart's in the company of um, a lot of very well-known architects of international renown. and. Um, it's, it's amazing that any of us are serving on the Commission of Stewart. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. Um, before we start the um, order of business, um, I, I think as we go through each matter, um, we'll have the applicant present their application, um, showing us key features of um, what they presented, of what's included in the, in the um, packet that they'd like to show us. We'll have um, commissioners ask questions and, and ask for clarifications. Um, we'll then give uh, members of the public, mostly those who've signed up, um, a maximum of two minutes to um, comment as they wish. And then um, any final discussion by the commissioners and uh, uh, generally speaking, a roll call vote. Uh, just to kind of remind everybody at the meeting, um, the Evanston Preservation Commission um, is a commission that has, um, you know, very limited powers. Um, our, um, our mission is to um, view building and demolition permits against the requirements, the standards for alteration, construction, and demolition in the Evanston Preservation Ordinance. Um, we only have a say on those. Um, we need to adhere to those in um, judging whether applications should be approved or disapproved. Um, but for everybody at the meeting, um, there may be a number, there may be any number of things that are good or bad about an application, any reason, many number of reasons why a project should or should not be built. Um, but we only have jurisdiction over the limited matters that are specifically set forth in our ordinance. And um, there may be all kinds of other matters that would be worthy of discussion in a different forum. Um, so having said that, uh, why don't we start the um, presentations? So um, the first matter of new business is 585 Ingleside Place, um, a landmark um, in, I guess it's the Northeast Evanston Historic District. And uh, we'd invite the, um, whoever speak, you know, in, in each case, when you speak, um, please introduce yourselves for the camera um, and um, present your application. Um, this is Elliot Flaws. I'm the applicant. Um, 
Fred Wilson will be presenting. Is there any way that we can actually share our screen with the same presentation to control the slides? Let me check, Elliot. You should be able to uh, right now. Do you see it as an option? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I just need to get the full screen. Good. Yes, we'll go from here. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Fred Wilson from Morganti Wilson Architects. Uh, congratulations, Stuart, on your award. Um, and this is Elliot Flaws, the project architect for the uh, for the buildings. We are proposing. There are actually two structures that um, one was an existing building, the existing boathouse that was destroyed by lake action and the other is a new boat storage with a terrace and uh, sitting space up above. Um, the site exists, it's kind of a funky site. The building is pushed all the way to the west. Um, the sort of dock area, if you will, runs sort of at a diagonal along the uh, lake front. Let's go to where the setbacks are. This is the existing building. It has a very steep pitch, um, which we are trying to mimic with the building that we're creating. It's a limestone and brick structure with painted windows. And then there's a large uh, north-south gable that if you can go to the ridge along the back, that establishes that steep pitch um, for the home. So um, this gives you the flavor. We're doing the coin corners and the masonry where we have that. So let's go to the next. This is then the, the street frontage. You'll see that big masonry wall that you really don't see anything from the street. Um, that is a new garage that was constructed a few years back. And then the next, the uh, view down below is the view from just inside the wall. So you can see to the left is where the one structure is going to be. And then to the right, uh, you'll see it's a curved roof that you look kind of right over the top. This is showing the existing structure that was there that housed uh, their kayaks and paddle boards and such. There's a davit that is used to launch the, um, the, the boats that are there. That existing sort of dock, concrete dock, has been there for many, many years. There is a revetment wall that's to the west of that dock area that's in very good shape. Um, the new structures that we're going to be putting in are going to be uh, anchored with micro piles down about 40 to 50 feet. Um, so it'll be a very stable structure. Let's go to the next. This just shows you now standing at the south end looking north. So that's where the um, kind of we're sort of standing where the one structure was is gone. And then that's where the new structure is going to be. And then this is now from the north looking back to the south. And then let's go to the next. These now, this shows you where the rear yard is, which runs along our north property line. So we're, we're well below the 40% allowable structures in the rear yard. You can see the building to the north. We pulled it off that setback. And then our side yard setback is five feet from the water's edge. And you can see the new structure is, is set back. Um, go up to the north one. That one is set back. So they're that we're off of the five foot. And then the, the southern structure we're building back in the footprint of where we were. This is the south building. It's just a long 
uh, storage facility. What we're going to do is it's going to be a steel structure, steel frame structure with six inch masonry block back up with four inch masonry veneer. So it's going to be a very solidly built so they don't go through this again. We arced the roof structure so that you kind of visually look right over the top of it. This is pushed down again onto the dock in our heights because it's dropping off from our approved uh, or whatever you want to establish grade. We're only coming out seven inches above the approved height or the accepted height for the piece of property because of the contours. Um, we essentially are pulling the coin corners uh, along the two sides with the limestone lintels. The windows will be the blue painted color. We're actually going to do them in uh, aluminum clad. Um, and then we have a metal roof that's up at the top. The next building then is the Northern structure that then has storage below. As I mentioned, the micro piles will be done from the inside of the foundation that'll run all the way around. They're gonna be about, I'd say 40 feet down, something in that range until we get the friction required to maintain a stable building. The, you go up the stairs right here to an open air terrace. And then there's a small sitting room that is in an inside structure that um, has no plumbing or kitchen or anything like that. It's just more of a sitting room. And then this, these are the lines that it looks like. So the lower level have the coins that match the existing home. Um, and then the upper, the upper area has the limestone and that runs as a small parapet. And then the slate roof that is going to match the slate roof of the house. It's all hurricane rated glass. We did a project down in St. John's that we used the hurricane rated glass. And when the two hurricanes came through, everything was fine. So we're, we're uh, going to follow the same building standards we use down there. Um, then we did a rendering that shows you the structure to the left that is very transparent. Um, and again, it's just more of a, an indoor gazebo, if you will. We thought the roof lines would tie in nicely to the current home. And then you can just see the roof of the Southern storage building. And we did that as a curve. So it really just kind of flows right over our, our uh, property, the grab, the lawn, the meadow in the backyard. And then again, just to refresh where the architecture came from, the coin corners, the limestone parapet wall that goes up, the roof pitch is extremely exaggerated. The masonry, we're going to match the brick color exactly in the blue color windows. And then these are just some blow ups of the details um, of the existing home that we're replicating. <clears throat> so if anybody has any questions, um, the owner is on as well, Peter or Dorothy, if you want to mention anything you could you could chime in hi Dorothy and I have lived in our Evanston home over 30 years we are proud stewards of our landmark property we thank the commission for their consideration and hope you will agree that this project's design and use of materials complements our historic home thank you so if, um, if you have any questions about our presentation, uh, let me know. Hey, Fred, I have a question. I, I like the little gothicized uh, gazebo that you've done. Um, I wonder about the scale of the big pieces of glass. Um, I know the idea is to pretend it's a gazebo with no glass there, but in reality, the glass will reflect uh, uh, a lot of the times. And I'm wondering if you looked at uh, breaking those down into uh, uh, divisions with muttons like the original house, just to uh, uh, give a sense of scale to the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could look at that. I, 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 um, 
I do like the mullions on the house. Um, and again, it adds to part of the, I like the blue windows. I think they add a nice little pop to the, uh, to the um, structure, but I could see looking at doing mullions. I, I also had thoughts with those large panels of glass and thought that they might conflict with standard three, the proportion of openings. So I think it would be helpful to look at mullions there as well. Okay. Yeah, Fred. the other The other thing is is sort of I appreciate the whole idea of trying to make structures that look pretend they're not there, but I sort of feel the same way about the uh, glass paneled railings. While I think they're kind of cool, uh, they are going to be there, and I wonder since there's a railing system, uh, a metal railing system that's on the house that's rather prominent in the pictures you showed us. Uh, whether you looked at doing the same kind of a railing system uh, on that little terrace. We did not. Again, that was sort of the idea to, to really feel like you're on the edge, you know, kind of looking out over. But um, I could talk to Peter and Dorothy about that. That's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I appreciate the siting of the two buildings and the... Uh, and the kind of suggestive recall of the of the roof forms, uh, uh, and and think as a scheme, it's nice overall. And I, I just wonder if uh, you know. I mean, I I get the desire to combine things that are very very modern with mm -hmm. sets of forms which are also traditional. And you know, the question is, uh, you know, where do you do that, and where do you stop, and then what's the sensed relationship to the existing house? Mm -hmm. go, go back to the to the uh, existing home. May I comment? We Ken and I are the immediate next door. I'm sorry, it's we're we're not to a public comment yet. We will oh. get to public comment. Thank you. I just wanted to make one note just about the glass railings. I think that if there was some consideration, um, I, I was a little uh, not comfortable with the glass railings either just because of standard number seven, the relationship of materials. And it was just a brand new use of glass there. And I understand about the balance and the view to the lake, but then when I visited the site and I saw those other railings, I was like, oh, maybe that could be an opportunity. Right. Just to help, oh. help that uh, standard number seven. Okay. All right, are there any other questions from commissioners? All right, we'll come back for any final discussion by commissioners. Um, all right, now I'm gonna ask Kate to um, read the names of people who signed up to speak. Um, for each person, first of all, um, please limit your talk to two minutes. Um, we do have a lot of people who wish to speak tonight. Um, and um, be before you start to you state your name for the, the um, recording. So Cade. I have one um, individual that signed up, uh, Lucy and Ken Lehman, the property owners uh, immediately north. Is now the time? Yes, please. Ken and I, first of all, had a wonderful relationship with our neighbors next door. And we feel now that there are some issues with talking about the one story masonry building that existed before. I did historic research. There is no evidence of any building being there except for what the Marxes built when they moved into, into the place. I have never, just as an aside, seen anything in there that resembles a kayak or paddle boards. It has only been jet skis. Regarding the two story, space, we considered an intrusion on our privacy. I don't have, because we were only, we were only informed of this project way after it existed. We regret that there wasn't neighborly communication. Consequently, I don't have the skill set to do what the architects are doing. But I, we believe that the height, the extra height really impacts on our deck and our light, excuse me, our light, 
our airflow. And what we're very concerned about is the closeness of it, destabilizing our pool, our boathouse, and our deck. But it's really the pool foundation that has been in place for 45 years. The boathouse we restored extensively. We had to use, I guess they're called micro pilings, but, but the fact that the earth is so unstable there and what's being proposed really could could be a problem oh, for us. Yes, um, okay, I'm sorry, is that is that the end of your presentation? Well, I mean, I don't know when two minutes are up because I didn't, I didn't. I think it's a timer. Our architect and structural engineer have yeah. alerted us we have you know, to the structural problem. problem. You know. And we also feel that the size, you know, that is it B, I, again, I haven't memorized the standards, but it looks like the scale of the structure, it, it's unnecessarily tall because repeating the roof line is fine, except that that tall exaggerated, which the architect has also oh, used okay. point was not original. And so we feel that the height <laughs> is out of proportion. Brother. I'm sorry, could we ask um, people who are not speaking to mute themselves? You're interrupting the speaker. Um, I, I, we just we feel that that it's much too big, and we also question why anybody needs two boathouses. Okay, um, and one was just a jet ski place, and we also are curious. We wonder if those buildings ever received building permits, and that's about you know. I'm sure that there are other things to say, but I want to be aware of the time constraint. Okay, and just to clarify, our, our commission is, um, um, if we issue a certificate of appropriateness, then the applicant still has to go obtain a building permit. It's not, um, you know. No, they, I, I, I understand that, but I know. think that it's such a serious matter that as one can, you know, can, when you consider your, your <laughs> valuations, I think that it would be hard not to think about the impact on the neighbor, and that's us. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, it, is there any other member of the public who'd like to speak to this matter? No. Um, is there any discussion by commissioners? Say that again? Yeah, uh, if, hi to Ken and Lucy. Um, what would be really useful in evaluating this would be to see the uh, site plan for the existing house and the two new pavilions, which need to be approved and permitted in relation to a site plan that shows your pool and your house so that we can better understand uh, the degree to which these will form part of the view from the back of your house and from the, uh, from, from your yard. So that would be uh, just a, a schematic plan of the adjacent property so we can understand those relationships. Uh, I'm sure the engineering uh, and the support of these uh, new structures on micropiles is, is being done so as not to destabilize the bluff because the whole idea of that kind of structure, which you say your pool is on, is that it doesn't uh, transfer any uh, lateral load to the bluff until you get down to the bottom uh, or the lower sections of the micro piles, which are below the uh, the toe, should be below the toe of the bluff. But it would be nice to have some additional information to understand better what the impact of this will be on your property since you're uh, okay. since you're worried about it. Well, we are worried, and I think that um, our architect Christopher Rudolph can speak to that and furnish what you need. Is he on the call and, and the meeting? I believe he is. Is he? Um, okay, well, this is a, um, we're moving on to any other public comments. So if your architect would like to speak as the matter of a public, he, you know, now would be the time. All right, I don't know. We didn't, 
Yeah, yeah I, I am on the call. Um, I, I am the, uh, been involved with the Lehman's since about 1977 or eight on this property. And the stabilization of the bluff is the biggest concern during construction, whatever is built there. Once the building is built, it actually stabilizes the bluff for both property owners. And, um, you know, the building permit and engineering of the site is uh, clearly um, a concern to the municipality as bo and both property owners, uh, but unstable bluff conditions are unpredictable and, and no matter what style of building is approved or, you know, what is eventually built is, is really not the concern. It's the stabilization of the bluff from what I can tell is, is a danger. And the engineering uh, that Morganti and Wilson will have to provide to get a building permit has to address that issue. I mean, that, that is um, typical along the lake and here. Um, so Carlos and Cade will the um, I, I mean will the building I mean th these aren't um, preservation issues. Um, will the building department be reviewing the plans for that purpose? Yes, they will. As far as I know, they haven't submitted for permit yet, but that's all something that the city engineer would review prior to issuing issuing the permit. Yeah. Or with Kate about the department. All right. Um, I think we'd already established there were no other speakers. Um, are, are there any more um, questions or comments from commissioners? All right. Um, would uh, any commissioner like to make a motion to approve? And in this regard, to the extent, I know there, there were a couple um, modifications um, mentioned, and I, and I don't know if you'd want to propose them as either required or recommended modifications. I guess I'll leave it to the person making the motion to decide that. Um, I don't know if it's Stuart or Beth, I think you both expressed opinions if one of you would like to speak to make a motion. Hey Mark, just to clarify the whole question of, uh, since this is in their property, the questions of bluff stabilization and the question of whether this is going to be a prominent new feature in the Lehman's view is not something that we uh, have, uh, as you pointed out at the beginning, have and are empowered to address. Is that correct? Well, clearly the criteria, of, you know, engineering criteria for issuing building permit are are not something we that are in our standards. Um, the, um, you know, I think that the standards don't. Um, Address, you know, we, we have these, you know, unfortunately constant um, conflicts um, where, you know, neighbors want different things. Um, the, the view from, from a neighborhood lot is not per se a standard. I think, um, you know, there's every reasonable effort should be made to, you know, like require minimal, minimal alteration of the property structure site or object. I mean, you know, clearly um, things visible from the public view, you know, we're entitled to to judge whether there's preservation concerns with that. But again, they have to be preservation concerns, not just. Um, and and we're, we're evaluating this as compatible new construction. Um, yeah, correct. I would just say one, one additional comment on that, Stuart, is that there are various standards that deal with associations between structures. But those are primarily um, intended for relationships within a, a district. And to be clear, the property to the north is not in a local district, nor is it a local landmark. So I'm not sure that those standards about association would next necessarily fall under the commission's purview in this in this instance. Um, if it wouldn't be an undue hardship on the uh, on the owners, uh, I would love to see uh, uh, suggestions about dividing the large areas of glass and the glass railings. And I wouldn't mind 
seeing the uh, some indication of the adjacent property because it looks like the uh, coastline uh, a, 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 as you move, uh, I guess it's to the north, is that right? To the Lehman's house, uh, seems to uh, angle away. So it may be when we see the, the placement of the back of the house that the, uh, although we're not, supposed to comment on it, the, the, uh, uh, that thing in their view may not be as big an issue. We're, we're, whoever just <laughs> drew, do you know approximately where the back of the adjacent house, the side on yes. the back of the adjacent house is? The main structure of the house? Yeah, the main structure, what is that? That's their boathouse. That's their boathouse. That's where that is. And and you can actually see it in our elevations. We drew a light line where that projects out past our structure. So Elliot is drawing where that that's approximately where the site situates. So and there are two large trees that are to our north. So we're we feel do you want to go to the elevations that show the um so you can see here um that light line right there is the boathouse that projects out past our building um so we we drew that as a reference point that's their handrail up there and um Let's go back to the go back to the rendering. And I'm okay, Stuart, if we do the mullions to look more like the house and the railing, I think that would be pretty. But if you can see then these the trees that are just to our yeah. left, yeah. they're pretty prominent that um, kind of obscures the house from their main house. Um. Stuart, we would welcome your site visit. But more, but the trees that you're referring to are not where you're thinking they are. Those trees are down on a lower area. They are not on the deck. They do not, they don't hide anything here at all. This is all our deck and those two trees, those two arbor vitae, and that's it. There's these two trees do not, and the, and you know, the architects for the Marxes are welcome to see for themselves. We welcome site visits. And for many commissioners. Yeah. I mean, I, unfortunately, I'm not sure we have any kind of jurisdiction over- We don't. <laughs> um, over over what, what's, what's in the view from the adjacent house. I, I was just curious how much of that you would you would see uh, from the back of your house from your yard. Obviously, you'll see it. Well, I think that I sent some pictures into all of you to look at, and I think that Mr. Sterling can probably point out photos that I've sent that are at that exact area. Those two trees are no place near where we would be viewing that building. Okay, do you have access to the... Uh, yeah. Sure, I can share my screen. Right, let's take our time and look at it if we've got the resources. Again, understanding those relationships is really informational. What we're being asked to do is to evaluate the um, structure, which under the zoning, uh, I think uh, the applicant has the right to build on their property and we're uh, reviewing it for its uh, relationship and compatibility with the existing structure. Yeah, okay, well, let's wait a minute while Kate finds it and we just, to the extent we have things we can view, now we should.
Yeah, I was I was just pulling that one up myself. So that's from the, the deck. I think that was the one that- Go I back to the aerial view, would you? It was up a little bit. Yeah, let's see that. Maybe that explains some stuff. Yeah, the house appears set back quite a ways even further probably than, than the subject property at Ingleside. I think it would be situated somewhere in here. Right, right there, yeah. That's the pool. Or I guess right here, actually, here's the, here's the concrete revetment here. Yeah. yeah, well, with the arborvita that were in the picture that we just looked at and the fence, uh, are you worried that this new pavilion is gonna uh, limit your views of the lake? No, I'm worried that it's going to take away a lot of sun on our deck, as well as stop the breezes from blowing because it's such an exaggeratedly tall structure. I also am concerned because of the location due to possible destabilization. I mean, I recognize that we are not allowed to say we lose a view that we've had for 45 years. That obviously does not count in this venue, but in terms of the rest of it, it is important to us. And I, we really would appreciate, you know, and we've asked in the past to have somebody, the architect, somebody come over and explain exactly what the visual impact would be we were not given that that um, request was not honored when the first renovation was done 20 years ago and we feel like we would like to to know and we were not made aware of this plan in a neighborly timely manner where we could even know these things so that's why we encourage visitations and you know and I mean, it's not what they want to build is not an unattractive thing. I actually agree with a lot of the comments that were made in terms of the design and change and all that glass, because we actually had glass garage doors in our boathouse that were hurricane glass, and we had metal awnings over those. And I have pictures of those too, which I've put in. And when the waves came, it destroyed those things. And so, you know, to us, to put that much glass when we've had such a, a clear experience with whether it's hurricane glass or not, it just, it just seems foolhardy. And also, I agree that the pieces of glass I liked what Commissioner Cohn pointed out, that they just aren't really in keeping with the style of the house. But I love glass. Okay. We have yeah, a modern I'm, house. Um, <laughs> sorry, we've, we've got to move on to um, conclude the matter. Um, you know, if, if commissioners are willing to vote today, is there anyone who's um, willing to make a motion tonight? Uh, before we make a motion, I just want to ask uh, my fellow commissioners when when we're when we're talking about them looking at uh, exploring mullion options in the um, instead of the clear sheet of glass that they have, are, are we are we thinking of breaking it up into multiple windows as they've done on the south elevation with mullions, or are we talking in addition to that, that it should be broken up into the individual mutton bars within each window? Isn't that up to the architect? It is, but I, the reason why I ask is if the applicant is, is prepared to uh, agree to the terms, if, if we're happy with the south elevation and they were willing to, it's the same, shape they were willing to duplicate that on the east and the west can we can we agree that that is is something that we would approve 
Um, I would say the mutton bars are what I feel is where we're heading with it. That I think would look more like the uh, the building, you know, the main building. Um, so I could see breaking those pieces up into into the mutton bars. I think will look great, and I think the handrail will probably replicate exactly the handrail from the house. Um, I mean, if we could make the motion um, subject just to a um, you know quick administrative return. And um, Carlos and Kate could then consult with one or two members of the commission to make sure those were okay. So again, it could be approved on that basis tonight. Okay. Okay, I, I think I could make the motion if we're ready. Okay. No more, okay. Okay. okay then. Okay, um, I recommend that for the property at 585 Ingleside Place, landmark, case 21 Prez 0133, that we issue the certificate of appropriateness to construct a single story masonry boathouse in the same footprint as an original wood frame structure previously demolished and construct a new two-story accessory structure with ground floor boat storage and upper roof enclosure and, upper and open terrace um, pending an administrative review of a new Munton pattern for the large um, glass walls on the east, uh, is it west, north, uh, and all the, I guess on the east, west, and south elevations and a change in the glass railing system per the administrative review. And the applicable standards you have to mention. Oh, yeah, that's right, thank you. The applicable standards here are for construction, numbers one through four, seven through eight, 10 through 11, 13 and 16. Um, thanks, would anybody like to second? I'll second. Okay, Commissioner Cohen seconded. Are we all clear on um, the, the present of the exact wording of the motion? Okay, then let, let's vote. Um, well, I'll vote Commissioner Bodan. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Dreller. Aye. And I'm an aye. So, okay, so thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the next um, matter is 217 Dempster Street, in the Lakeshore Historic District. Um, so it's also, I guess, a landmark home. Um, could the person making the presentation for the applicant introduce themselves and um, show us the project? Hey. I can hear Hello? you. Yep. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I'm David with Reno Ogden Architects, uh, and we are looking to add to a rear coach house of a Daniel Burnham house, which we're currently uh, renovating with our with the clients there. It's a it's a showpiece of a home, and they're doing uh, some wonderful work out there to renovate that. Just see the, the previously approved drawings there. And then at the back, there's an old coach house that we want to add on to to the side uh, to help frame the only yard they have, which is that side yard, and also to give a uh, an escape for uh, parents of three daughters every now and then. And we're keeping identical materials, every, everything exact to what's there, uh, and just adding another uh, gable to the end of that to get a little more height out of the space uh, with a lowered floor and a storage area beneath. And a picture's worth a thousand words, and my words are, are not uh, not that eloquent. So if you want to go through the pictures, that would uh, communicate, and I'll take any questions. I mean, could you just show us the um, the alterations in, in new construction? Yeah, it's the uh, 
is you see the existing uh, on the left side of that page, South Elevation existing, and the right side is the addition, which is just that matching dormer going over uh, an extension of the roof to match that. So it's that little piece on the right that we're adding. Okay, and then on the South Elevation? South Elevation, it is, we're extending that shed dormer as well. Uh, Katie, we're go back up to the, uh, Let's see. There we are right there. So we're blocking in the windows on the back side, adding to the uh, to the left side there and putting two new windows there. Uh, those current back windows do face in other homes. We're moving those away and putting it out where they're off that house behind us and getting a little bit of light into the newer space on the side there. And, and I will note that um, when I went out and visited, at least, I could not see that this elevation was visible at all from from any public way no it, it's it's pretty much only one that's it's on the street is that front one everything else is blanketed by the back of the house or by trees on the uh, on the side okay could i'm sorry could you tell us what we're looking at that's the existing uh, coach house there entry from the side for the cars and then the next page next photograph over is the existing dormer adding kind of doubling that dormer going out to the right on that piece there that will show back on the on the proposed elevation Katie if you go back to that that picture uh, right there lower right hand corner So you can see that that dotted line that comes down from where the two dormers meet. That's the that's the line of the existing dormer as it comes down. So we're adding on that, that piece to the right of that. I know my younger employees are gone, so I can't. I don't know. I can't. I don't know how to put this on my screen and do anything for them and talk you through it. I apologize. That might be all the drawing. And maybe the rendering might be floor plans or the site plan. You might want to talk about that. That crosshatch line there is what we're adding. And the rendering shows the kind of before and after right next to it. Right there. So those yeah, on the right side there. Up at the top, you see the existing coach house and the bottom is that simple dormer we're adding to match the existing dormer or, or gable end, I'm sorry, on the on the right side. And there's also a small access stair, correct, David, on this yeah, elevator? That's an existing stair that we're going oh, with yeah, a new stair going down to a lower storage area beneath it, correct. And we're matching the railings of the house, the original Burnham design on that uh, on that stair going down, which is right there. Thank you, Cade. Why does the new um, gabled structure to the, I guess it's towards the lake, have um, no, no lower story windows? Well, the, because the, the, uh, the carriage house has a very high ceiling in it, that there's very little space up there. So the new floor line kind of cuts in, cuts the bottom of the other window, cuts through there. Uh, so there's, it'll be an odd position to have the windows either up higher we thought that looked a little strange it looks strange to have windows that will be cut by a floor we have in the past put in windows and just painted them black so they look like they're there but just disappeared <laughs> they're black from the outside anyway during the during the day and the night there are no lights on so we we considered that uh but up in the in the, in the uh way of honesty in this case but we could certainly add those to match exactly what's there all right is there anything else you'd like to show us uh, no, any any questions? I hopefully I've again. I apologize. I can't use my mouse to click around this thing. But if you have any questions at all, or hopefully it's it's clear with those pictures there. A question: Is that a downspout that comes down from the valley of the two peaks, right in Correct. the center? Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? 
and the, yeah, the current household has copper downspouts. Now we just match that with the copper. Was there any member of the public who wished to speak to this matter? Any discussion by commissioners? Would any commissioner like to make a motion to approve? Sure. Uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, regarding 217 Dempster Street, 21 Pres, dash 0134, uh, landmark in the Lakeshore Historic District, um, that we uh, approve a, a certificate of appropriateness to construct an addition to the east volume of the property's detached accessory structure and alter the accessory structure's fenestration on the north elevation upper story, applicable standards, alteration one through 10, construction one through five, seven through eight, and 10 through 13 and 15. A second? Second. Commissioner Cohen. Um, okay, then a roll call vote. Um, Commissioner Bodan. Aye. Commissioner Morris. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Driller. Aye. Uh, and I'm an aye. So thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time and efforts. Um, all right. So the next matter of new business is 1233 Judson Avenue in the Lake Charles Historic District. Um, hello. Um, do I start now or are you introducing? So you, you, can, you, you can introduce yourself, please. All right. Uh, I'm Nathan Kipnis. Uh, I'm the architect of the property. Uh, we have our office here in Evanston. And um, I can introduce the project as well. It's a uh, four unit masonry building. It is uh, contributing in the uh, neighborhood. Um, the work that we're going to be doing is to uh, make the building very energy efficient. And by doing that, we're going to put um, some solar panels on the south. Um, we're changing out all the windows uh, with, with new windows. And we're adding a roof deck um, on the roof with a dormer for access and railings around that. So if you go to actually page eight, I think would be a good place to start because that the uh, drawings until then are just existing drawings. So here you can see the uh, solar panels in two sets. There's a uh, dormer in between set about approximately halfway back on the building. Uh, and then you see the deck and we'll go to a enlarged image in a minute. Um, or we'll start working our way there. So these are the existing floor, or I'm sorry, the new floor plans there on that image right there is showing the dormer. Uh, the stairs coming up and going out to a roof deck. The uh, roof deck is set back three feet from the south property line um, to align with the setback. And um, that's it. The windows are going to be all casement clad windows that are mimicking uh, in proportion and uh, dimension all of the uh, double hung windows. And we're doing that for high performance in the building. Um, it will have the matching muttons and mutton patterns, and uh, the color will be the matching black that's there right now. So I think that's, that's the back of the building if you want to continue along. So that's from the front. That dormer is set way back. You really don't see that from the front very easily, um, not as it shows in this image where it looks like it's at the front. It's actually past the halfway point. And you, you can see on this, the casement windows are indicated, but they are going to appear um, as double hungs. There are a few areas that are being patched when windows are being moved, not too many, but a few of them. You can see some on that image. 
And this is the uh, image that shows half the building approximately, uh, the front set of solar panels and then a dormer and the roof deck. And that's the back half of the uh, southern exposure as well. So additional panels in that same dormer. And uh, this picture shows the L shape of the building and the dormer is back at the, uh, at the L on the right. So you can see from the front portion of the building, it's set back quite far. Um, the rest of the images are just the window drawings and uh, showing the existing windows next to them. And then these are the adjacent buildings uh, in the neighborhood. Um, how the solar panels would attach to the roof. And that's, that's our submittal. So if you have any questions, be happy to answer them. Nate, do you have a three-dimensional uh, view, which is one of the requirements for the submission? Um, we do not. Do you have any um, documentation about the condition of the windows that merits a full replacement of the whole program? And then so, also, can you talk to the decision to change the, oper oper the operation of the windows? Yeah, they're definitely interconnected. So what we're trying to do is make a building that's all electric, that's, um, I would say, ultra high performance. And to accomplish that, um, double hung windows are not very good at all with their um, keeping in the heat. They lose a lot through the lap seal as opposed to a casement that shuts kind of like a refrigerator, a gasketed door. So the idea is we're gonna go all electric. So air source heat pumps for the heating and the air uh, heating, cooling and um, water heater and dryer and an induction cooktop. And the solar panels will connect to a battery backup system um, we're going to air seal this building very tightly. Uh, we really want to make this a kind of a demonstration home uh, building that shows that, you know, multifamily historic buildings can be brought up to uh, ultra high performance standards. And uh, it's something the owner is on board with, and it's something that we need to move our buildings to very quickly. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the condition of the existing wood windows? So some of them are in not great condition. Some of them are in decent condition. Um, the idea again is um, we're going to be putting in a lot of money above market rates to do this. Um, and if the windows aren't performing the way that they need to, then that sort of wipes out the whole effort that we're trying to accomplish. Did you look into weatherproofing the existing double hungs? I know you can put gaskets at the meeting rail too. Yeah. You know, they, they just are not going to perform like a casement window. So to answer your question, we did not look into that. Do the current windows have storms on them? Yes, they do. So they're currently uh, aluminum triple tracks. Uh, the, the presence of the uh, storm windows, uh, uh, I think, factors into the uh, difference in the way the windows will look. Obviously, the casement, the glass is all in one plane, whereas with the uh, action of a double-hung window, the uh, uh, lower sash is set in, which is the problem you're identifying for air infiltration. But the minute you put a storm window over that 
you know, even the triple tracks, the, uh, uh, you know, it's almost moot in terms of the appearance. So frankly, uh, I totally get what you're trying to do going from the casements to the double hungs. Uh, and uh, I don't know how I, you know, from an energy point of view, you're doing absolutely the right thing from a uh, historic uh, 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 preservation point of view. I'm not sure how I feel about the change. Um, I could show you an image of my previous house where we did exactly this because of egress concerns. I have, if I can share, if I can figure this out. Um, I don't know. Can I be allowed to do that? You should be able to, Nate. Um, there oh, should okay. be a green arrow somewhere. It's a share screen. All right. So I'm... Uh, boy, I don't know if this will work. Yeah. Yeah. Nate, I think that, it, that might be helpful to the other commissioners. We've done exactly the same thing because unless you've got a very wide double hung uh, in a bedroom, you can't meet egress when you can just get out the lower section. Of yeah, open. I'm, I'm not going to be able to share the screen, but um, it it's, yeah. So we've done this for both reasons before, for egress and for um, high performance. Um, okay, any other questions for the applicant? Uh, Nate, can you confirm that there are no lugs on the outside of the double hungs? Um, I believe we drew what's there. So I don't think there are, but I, I could check that and get back to you, but I do not believe that is the case. And I don't think that the, you know, the pictures aren't gonna show any, I don't believe. I don't see them in the photos, but the storm windows are kind of blocking the view a little bit. I understand. It doesn't, it doesn't look like that. there are any. All right. Um, Excuse me, can you also, um, for the alteration standard number three, talking about alterations, um, uh, alterations to sites, building structures, or objects that have no historic basis shall be discouraged. Can you talk about that roof deck? <laughs> so the roof deck is a, um, it's a very tempting thing to have in, in, in a building. So there is this flat roof section. If you go back to page eight, I think you'll see the flat roof area. And the owner had identified the thought, um, yeah. So in that one section, there's a flat roof and it's a perfect opportunity for a roof deck. So um, obviously the deck isn't seen. Uh, it's a pretty steep pitched roof though. And so there are some stairs. If you go down, I think three more images, you'll see the uh, close up of that. Um, and uh, so the railings are the one part that shows. Um, so that's the one visual addition. I'd actually uh, intended to ask you about the railings. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Uh, black metal railings, and um, they're just, uh, you know, again, we set them back from the property line because the existing building is non-conforming and over. So you see that set back on the left there. Um, but that's all, um, you know, that's uh, aluminum, pre-finished aluminum, uh, railing system. All right. Well, why don't we? We'll come back to the commissioners. Um, it, it, was there any member of the public who wished to speak to this matter? Um, okay, is there any other discussion by commissioners? Um, just, 
I'm just not, I'm having trouble with the full program of window replacements on a building where for, you know, with our standards in mind, with original hundred plus year old windows being replaced for energy efficiency, which I applaud, but I think that there are ways to make wood windows plenty energy efficient so that they are not the main uh, problem in the building envelope. Um, and I think that those options should be attempted first before a wholesale replacement with windows that are going to be, you know, replaced again in 20, 25 years. Um, I just don't think that that's the option, especially then using, you know, changing the operability, the form of operation, and then changing the, um, the, the, um, the depth of the windows and, you know, making them a flat um, presentation rather than the depth that you get from the true um, double on the windows. And then um, the roof deck, I just don't see it as fitting on this building. Um, it's a neighborhood where, or it's a building that's situated among you know, a variety of different kind of homes. And um, I just don't see the roof deck. I, I, I feel like it's just kind of like landing on there and not really working within the existing building and design. Um, also just uh, not having a historic basis. I want to make one point if I can. Sure, um, please. The roof deck is going to be uh, accessed only by one unit who's the building owner and so it's it won't it, in effect it'll be like a single family uh, deck it's not going to be available to the other tenants my, my point is that's a good point <laughs> um, i hadn't thought about that point of it but i think my concern is just the um just the visual of it just um all of a sudden having those the railings up there um, yeah, I just don't see it fitting in. Um, could you show us the slide one more time with the, um, the street view of the... It's at the very bottom. There you, there you go, right there. And so, so the, the deck would be back in the... I guess yeah. the kind of two... All right, so it's all the way back there. Mark, are you recommending that uh, the deck, the railing in the deck, which is already set back from the property line, which would be the right in this photograph, might be set back further from the uh, front edge so that the view from the street, uh, uh, you know, so you wouldn't see the railing except maybe from a house, the second floor of a house across the street or from maybe the lawn of one of the houses across the street. I, mean, I was just wondering how minimized the view will be. And I, I don't think we quite have anything that'll tell us that. Yeah. Hey, Cade, could you remind us, uh, I should remember this, but is this uh, a, contrib a landmark, a contributing structure or simply in a district? Um, it's a contributing building in the Lakeshore district. So it's not a landmark. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, Commissioner Bowden, the, um, you know, I mean, the city has certainly asked that we um, favor energy efficiency and sustainability. And of course, in the context of the solar panels, where I think initially a few years ago, um, we were reluctant to approve them because they are, um, you know, look so jarringly industrial and not um, consistent with historic district. We then passed specific standards for those, which you know, I, I think by the, um, particularly by the direction they're facing in this house, um, you know, meet, we'll, we'll meet those standards. Um, the issue of um, window replacement for where it's necessary for energy efficiency is not one we've actually ever talked about. I mean, it's a really good point. And I think it's just one of those issues where, um, you know, two things we, we, we care about, both of the historic preservation and energy efficiency simply conflict with each other. And so I'm not sure, I mean, we've never before had to discuss 
this exact issue. Well, I don't agree. I, I think that historic windows can be energy efficient. I, I don't think that they, I think that there's many options that can be done to, to make the windows um, more weather tight. You know, like when was the last time that they were reglazed, reputtied? When was, when were the, you know, when were the stops, when were they taken off and repainted and scraped? And, you know, I think that there's just some other options to be had there. Um, better storm windows, curtains on the inside. There's many different steps that one can take before you go and you replace every window on a building when they aren't in bad shape. So can I- I think it's a tough balance. I, I understand the goal, but I just, I hate to see that. Not, I hate, um, I just don't think it's the right step to take to, to do a, a wholesale replacement like that. So, can, I, can I ask you, um, would you be talking about then standard number one for alteration where it's done in a manner that requires minimal alteration? Is that what you're referring to? Some yeah. attempt at minimal alteration? I think there's also a standard about repairing and, and um, replacing in kind when when possible. I think that's to repair number six. When possible. Mm -hmm. and, and number one as well, too. It's just, you know, when you have a program of windows that are in fair condition, that are still operating with, you know, still working within 120 years, and I understand that they're working at a different rate than what the goal is right now, so, so do the maintenance, do, do the work that it takes, do the minimal, minimal work that it could take and then start your measurements and, and, and take and, uh, and see what's possible and see what your performance is. Can I answer one aspect of that? Sure. So um, the existing windows, single glazed with storm windows are gonna be an R2 and uh, the new windows will be double that and then the infiltration rates, I don't have them at my fingertips, but they're multiples of what's existing there. Mm -hmm. So it, when you combine those, it's almost like a factor of 10 that, they, that these windows are better than what's gonna, that, well, than a single glaze. You know, certainly uh, it's gonna be a tremendous multiple of what's existing there. So I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're trying to do. I've been involved with the, with the uh, historic districts in Evanston for a couple decades. And I, I certainly know um, what's involved, but I, this is a whole different animal. This is trying to make this building um, an order of magnitude better than what's existing there. And that's honestly what we need to be doing. Um, one other quick point, and I, I apologize for not saying this before, but there is a roof deck two buildings south at 1230 uh, south of this building. Um, I don't know the address, but just for reference. There's a what on there? Roof deck. Two, two houses south, two buildings south. You know, I, I think Mark brings up a, a good point by, by making a comparison to the acceptance of, uh, of solar panels on these buildings. And while I'm generally in favor of rebuilding double hung windows, which, which we've done, including uh, reinstalling them with, uh, with fins to stop infiltration at the side of the, uh, of the frames, you still have to deal with you know, the best you can do on the meeting rail. We've had them reglazed with, you know, with thin uh, thermopane, and it's a wild expense compared to a new window, which is still a much better product from an energy point of view. So for me, uh, I would almost say, uh, you know, if this were a landmark building, I would say no. If it were a contributing structure, uh, uh, I would, you know, I would have to think twice about it. But uh, in this case, I understand what Nate is trying to do. And, um, you know, I think it's applaudable. Uh, and I think I do think it creates a dilemma if you're a, a, a you know a, a purist or are or are trying to adhere to the standards which ask for things to be repaired and rebuilt instead of replaced because simply because they're historic. So you know 
I, I, I want to go on record and just support what Beth has been saying. I, I agree with this. And I think I've mentioned in other meetings that I've personally gone around my house and restored my own 100-year-old wood windows. So I know it can be done. And I understand the points about the testing, but um, I'd like to see you know, a performance testing comparison. So what's the comparison between a totally swapped out window and an upgraded addressed uh, double hung versus what's there now? So I'll, I'll just make uh, one point as a point of recommendation is that I think the life cycle of the new windows is important to consider as compared to a historic window. So even, you know, typically the best new window is, you know, you might get 30 years out of it in a really good instance where you could continually repair a historic wood window that has significant embodied energy and are typically made of really high quality wood that is near irreplaceable um, today. That's an excellent point. Not to mention the the disposal of the wood windows and the landfill that then you're going to fill and the carbon footprint to take them out, take them in. Take I'd be them happy to, to give you the uh, life cycle carbon analysis of all of that. There may too be um, perhaps certain elevations that you could restore the windows on Nate and other elevations where you could replace um, certainly the elevations that aren't visible. Or is that a compromise that somebody wants to uh, to suggest that the the front facing windows are restored and that they're uh, fitted with uh, new storm windows and that the rest of the stuff is replaced? Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah, I, I like the idea. I mean, Nate, we've. Um, you know, we've consistently required, we've always required, I think with good reason, people to document um, the, the condition of wood windows that they're um, removing as, um, and, and I think on the whole, we've leaned somewhat towards the applicants and allow them pretty wide leeway, but we've certainly never had anyone come before us and said the windows are in pretty good condition. And certainly from the, the pictures shown, they look to be. And, and I think, I do think we're going to have to compromise on the energy efficiency issue. And it's, but, but it's a real hard case. It's, it's further than we've ever gone before. And um, I'd prefer the applicant come back both with, you know, documentation as energy efficiency and then, um, you know, some kind of proposal to, I mean, I think keeping the windows in the front facade would be a great idea. Can you repeat that last bit? I think we're keeping the windows on the, the front facade would be a great idea. Nate, with, with uh, those windows restored with storms on them uh, in terms of uh, uh, both our value and infiltration, how would they compare to the uh, new wood casements you're proposing? Um, you know, it would be really in interesting to see if we got Hot, very high quality storms, you know, with the hard coat low E on it. And then um, uh, I might need to talk to you, Stuart, about what you used on some of these uh, components, you know. Um, but if we were to try and make a super tight existing window, it might even be a good research project for the district. So, you know, maybe that is a good thought. I mean, certainly we can look at that. I don't know if it comes back that it's still really bad, like, truly not in range, then we would probably not want to look, you know, our opinion would be it wouldn't be a good thing, but we would uh, certainly want to talk about that. Okay, well, I, I think if, I mean, unless anybody has additional comments, I think, um, you know, it sounds like a lot of commissioners would appreciate a relook at this. And, you know, as I think Commissioner Bowden correctly says, we've never approved anything like this before. And we're going to have to think hard about energy efficiency, but um, you know, I, I think we need to examine the question really carefully and yeah. you know, have you look at alternatives and potential compromises. And, and if I may, I think what you're saying, I, I support what you're saying, especially because um, the idea of using this as a precedent moving forward, I think then doing a little bit more study now would be really helpful 
helpful for this property as well as the commission. Yeah, I think it could be an opportunity. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I don't remember if we asked if there's any public comment. I assume there wasn't. I don't think so. Is there any um, definitive direction we should give him on the rooftop deck since he's going to come back? My, my feeling about the rooftop deck is that it's certainly an acceptable use. I think that the concern would be whether or not you see the railing from the front. Uh, just looking at the uh, at the deck as proposed, uh, you know, or the railing system as proposed, I wonder if you could figure out a way to uh, eliminate the heavy balusters and to make the whole thing just light, uh, uh, sorry, the heavy newels and to make the whole thing just light balusters, even if you need to uh, uh, brace them uh, diagonally, uh, you know, every seventh or eighth uh, baluster. Might, it might be helpful to do um, sort of a mock-up on this photo that that is here. Mm -hmm. You could do that. Kind of a yeah. So it doesn't have to be fancy. Just showing us the height. Oh. Yeah. Good idea. All right. Um, would someone like to uh, make a motion to continue this matter till our um, November meeting? Mark, I'm happy to do that, but I um, have never made a motion to continue. So I mean, I think it's about a <laughs> I'm sorry. I think it's about a sentence. Oh, okay. I'd like to make a motion to continue the um, ap application for um, 1233 Judson Avenue in the Lakeshore Historic District 21 Prez 0135 to the next meeting, the November Commission meeting. Yeah, I think it's November 9th. November 9th, 2021, commission meeting. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay, uh, roll call vote. Um, Commissioner Baudin? Aye. Commissioner Morris? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Dreller? Aye. And I'm an aye. All right, call. Thank you, and uh, congratulations, Stuart, on your award. Very, you, very well deserved. All right. All right. So um, our next matter, which is not an application of certificate of appropriateness, is twelve seventeen Michigan Avenue, the Lakeshore Historic District. Um, the um, motion is actually a motion that I think has never um, been before the commission since any of us. Have been on it, and I think it's potentially confusing. So I just want to um, briefly explain um, what needs to be decided today and what doesn't. So the um, the, the process that um, we go through maybe a dozen times a year, um, as per the last you know, application, is um, well, if if the com the commissioner we can disapprove or in that case continue. But at any rate, in the um, Preservation ordinance. There's a provision that if we, if the commissioner disapproves, the commissioner shall make reasonable efforts to confer with the applicant, offer technical guidance, and attempt to resolve differences. The applicant may resubmit an amended application based upon the recommendations of the commission. Um, and so, quite frequently, every year we continue. We um, encourage the applicant. You know, even if we turn it down, we encourage the applicant to resubmit, um, and then we offer to confer to try to have the resubmission successful. And, and I'd say that, you know, certainly the majority of time, um, the modified or resubmitted application is successful and, you know, that process works. And that's, I think, how we'd all like it to work. Um, I, I don't know that we formally offered the um, applicant at the last commission the, the opportunity to do that, but certainly the opportunity to confer, to submit a modified application and seek approval is, um, you know, certainly an avenue that I think does remain open. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the time applications like this are approved on resubmittal if there are, you know, reasonable compromises made. Um, what the applicant has asked today is not that, although I think, again, it'll still be available whether or not we approve this. Um, but it's a, 
what, what's called a request for reconsideration that's not in the ordinance, but in our rules. And it, it's very limited. It says the applicant is allowed to present evidence in support of the request for reconsideration. Such evidence shall be limited to that which is necessary to enable the commission to determine whether or not there has been a substantial change in facts, evidence, or conditions relating to the application. Um, and so really, we would only in, entitle the, the motion for reconsideration if there's a substantial change from our last hearing in the facts, evidence, or conditions. Um, and then if we did approve it, um, we'd then have to set the new hearing, which I assume would be at the next meeting, um, although that's something the commission would have to decide the, the timing of it. Um, so the applicant, at any rate, um, this, you know, the, the issue today is not whether the um, requested certificate of appropriateness should be issued, but simply whether we should, whether there are new facts, um, well, actually it's less the scientific facts, evidence or conditions relating to the application, which suggests we should rehear the application. Um, and so I think I'll turn it over to the applicant to introduce the speaker and um, again, just make the presentation with respect to the motion you've made um, based on the criteria and the rules. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bernard Citroen of the law firm of Thompson Coburn. I'm representing the Nickel family today along with me um, are the Nichols and along with them is Gary Schumacher and Blair, our architects um, who were present at the prior hearing. Um, very briefly to just address the motion that we are requesting today, um, we strongly believe that there were issues both in the, uh, mainly with the surrounding neighborhood that were not taken into account by the commission in denying our application when this was first before the commission. Um, I will keep this brief to just those major issues. Um, number one, um, and we have provided the actual documentation, there are any number of houses in this neighborhood that have garages that are not only attached garages, but follow the front line of the houses. Um, this is not a landmark residence or, or building. Um, it's not even noted as being a contributing building. Um, it is a building in a landmark district. And if you look at your own statute that you are uh, bound to follow, um, the change, while it does change the exterior view of, uh, from the street, it does so in a minimal way and it is not out of line with other houses in the neighborhood. And we don't believe that was taken into account um, at the hearing that was held um, the first time. Two, um, and I cannot substitute myself for um, the views of, of the commission, that's, that's your job, but it does appear that a significant um, impact was given to the neighboring building next door and potential issues over light and air. Um, specifically, that building today is a is a is a pre-existing legal non-conforming building, and more importantly, the windows are on the property line, which is a condition that would not be allowed today. But more importantly, if we look at the effect, yes, there will be effect. It would be um, disingenuous of myself to argue mm -hmm. that there would be no effect if this garage was moved to where we're seeking um, to move it. But the effect. Um, long term is, I hate to say this, somewhat minimal with all due respect to those neighbors. One, one of the windows out of the three, you can't see out of anyway. It is entirely covered with ivy. And you can see that from a picture that was not brought up at the first hearing. Two, there is a tree, a very large tree that blocks those windows. Again, we don't believe that was brought up in sufficient detail at the first hearing. And three, the, these, are, these windows do not serve a major light and air um, provision for, those, for that unit. All of the rooms that, that, that have these windows in them have another set of windows on the interior courtyard for this reason, because they put the windows on the property line. Other structures, if this was not a historic district, other structures could be built here with the same effect without any issue as to light and air on those windows because they are on the property line. Those rooms would still be legal and would still have light and air from the interior courtyard. And we don't believe that was brought up. It was an also a sort of a minor um, thing that we weren't too sure about in the findings that this commission made 
you mentioned light and air to basement windows. Um, there is no basement windows. Those windows were bricked up many, 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 many years ago. So if that was at all a consideration, that should also be a reason for a reconsideration of what we're presenting here today. Um, going a little further into what um, the chair um, came up with is we were not afforded that ability to potentially take this project back and bring it forward um, at a continued hearing uh, dealing with some of the issues, for instance, the eyebrow, um, maybe the roof height, um, the, the length of the uh, Port Crochet. Those are typically the type of items that this commission, we saw that happen this evening, would allow a, um, someone to, to, to make those changes and be back. And that wasn't done. So um, Gary, unless you have something else to add to this, those seem to me to be the major issues that we wanted to bring forward uh, here today in support of our motion to reconsider because they were not dealt with um, in what we believe a strong enough matter at the first hearing. Uh, thank you. One, one clarification, this building is a landmark in the district it's listed as such and we have treated it as such. Um, and the, the homeowner will speak in a moment to, uh, to reiterate their value of that landmark status. Um, we also intend to present a additional evidence relative to the surrounding buildings in the context of the construction standards uh, that this commission found that our application did not meet. Uh, we address this more specifically as an addition and an alteration to an existing house. Um, and it was made clear in the findings of fact that this commission saw this more as a construction project and more strenuously uh, viewed under those standards. So we'd like the opportunity to present additional evidence and information to those, to those points specifically. Um, I'm sorry, did you say the owner also wished to speak on, in relation oh, yeah. to the application? Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? If you could just introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Jake Nickel, and my wife Shandi and I, we, we live here at uh, 1217 Michigan Avenue. Um, and I'll keep this brief. I really just wanted to take a moment to let the commission know that how, how much we care about preserving the historic significance of this home. Uh, we put a lot of effort into it over the last eight years that we've lived here. And we've gone through all the proper channels each step of the way. Um, in fact, during we did a major window restoration project, which was interesting to hear just now because you know, we used leaded glass apparently from the same era that the house was built. And I remember in the process, Carlos even suggested that we apply for one of the preservation awards that it looks like you're discussing shortly after this. And so I, I, our decision to work with uh, the Shoemaker Design Associates as our architect was really rooted in their experience designing for historic homes in this area. And, you know, Gary has served on this permission, the commission here in the past. And so we were confident in his understanding of the guidelines that, you know, are in place and would use that in his design process. So we really knew he'd respect the history of our home. He'd respect the neighborhood in this process. And I think he's really demonstrated that in the work that he's done. Um, we feel like keeping the garage itself detached, um, but keeping it in the rear of the lot and then using the attached roof as a breezeway felt like the most viable solution that we could find um, with both, you know, the history of the home and as a functional solution for our family. Um, but I, I do want to acknowledge that I greatly respect the opinions from our neighbors. We understand that having a view affected can be annoying. And, you know, I've been in that situation as an, having a neighbor that made changes to their property um, that affected our view in the past. And, you know, but we understood it's their right to, to do so. Um, also, construction is obviously no fun to live through. We're not looking forward to that ourselves. Um, glad it's temporary. But basically, just want to say we really respect your feedback in this process and hope you'll consider this new evidence that we have to present. And um, just thank you for your time. Um, I don't know if commissioners um, have viewed the package and don't need to, but I think a lot of the, the kind of new documentation presented was comparison to other houses in the neighborhood that wasn't shown. Last time, would that help or do commissioners feel that they've already viewed that and understand it? Yes, Stuart. Um, you know, I think we, the, the meeting was recorded and, it, and I think that's a great idea. Uh, my memory of the meeting was that the commissioners uh, 
apologized to the people in the lower levels of the adjacent building and explain to them that we have no purview over protecting their light and air and that the positioning of the garage, as long as it fell within the zoning setbacks required, was allowable uh, and that it may have been unfortunate that they were going to be looking at the side of the garage, but that that would not and should not factor into our evaluation of the project. Uh, Cade, I'd like that confirmed because the lawyer suggested something very different from that in terms of our evaluation of the project. I also would like Cade to confirm the following because I may have a faulty memory of it, but did we ask Gary whether he wanted a continuation or wanted a, a determination at that point? Because I think uh, my memory is that Gary said he wanted a vote on the project and that his position was at that point beginning to be adversarial. I, I don't re I don't recall ever asking um, Gary if if he would like a, to continue it to come back or not. I'll be completely transparent and say that the video is recorded, but it it has not been made accessible to me. It's been about thirty days, and it's um, the broadcast coordinator has not released it yet um, for various reasons. Yeah. So, so all of my notes and my and my minutes those are handwritten notes in the minutes. Um, to your other point, I don't specifically recall mentioning um, that elevation not being under the purview of the commission. I think it would be true to say that the light and air issues specifically may not be within the commission's purview, but certainly that is the association between structures, many of the standards deal with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why we didn't propose a continuation. Uh, maybe I misremember the information. I, for one, would have been happy with that. I think that the objections which your lawyer actually did mention had to do primarily with the scale of the eyebrow window and then with the depth of the, uh, of the porch connection from the front of the garage to the, uh, to the existing house, which uh, Gary Shoemaker had compared to the front porch and the commissioners observed was... Uh, you know, more than twice the depth of the front porch. So, you know, I think with those things addressed, I would be happy, and I can't can only speak for myself, I would be happy to have approved it. Um, okay, I, th I think the, um, you know, the bottom line on that is that there were, uh, there was a lot of discussion, but there definitely, if you read even the, the findings, there were specific architectural preservation issues mentioned. I think, primary, you know, I think Mr. Cohen mentioned them most um, cogently, and um, you know, whatever issues there are are you know going to be discussed again at a hearing. I mean, the, the there's a ton of requested public comment. If we do have a hearing, that I'm sure people will show up again. But from the point of view of the commission, there definitely were specific architectural issues uh, to be addressed. I mean, just as a matter of procedure, the um, you know, if we if we agree, if we vote to reconsider, um, and again, I assume it would be at our next meeting, the applicant, it says the applicant should be given the opportunity to present any other additional supporting evidence. Um, and then I think I did see some summary somewhere that that Evans could, um, and I think would need to, um, you know, have some changes to the, the plans. So I think it would be really the equivalent of um, the conferring and, and resubmitting. And, and I think, you know, even though this um, specific part of the rules doesn't mention it, um, you know, it's clear that the sentence in the um, disapproval paragraph that the commission shall make reasonable efforts to confer with the applicant, you know, attempt to resolve dis differences is something we would all still be happy to apply. I mean, this is not the, this is the kind of thing that generally um, with reasonable compromises does, you know, of, of gets approved almost every time. And we would definitely, you know, um, advise the applicant to try to, um, you know, ha have a positive relationship with commissioners and try to work through the problem and um, come up with something that does get approved. Mark, if I can just um, clarify one point, when I talked to uh, the city's legal counsel, they informed me that if there's a motion for reconsideration, um, that the case would be heard 
that same night. I think there's language in there that it says treated as a new case at that time. And, I, and that's how they interpreted that, that it would basically then that is when Gary would be permitted to, to go into that additional information in more depth. And then the commission could determine to continue the case, um, approve with conditions. Um, they could deny it again um, or just approve it. But that's that's what I was told by by our legal counsel. Cade, can I ask you a question? It 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 needs to the reconsideration needs to be the same application as before, right? Or the same project? Is that well, yeah? So I yeah, to be a, a considered a reconsideration, it can't be just a resubmission. So he he wasn't permitted. Um, per our legal department's direction to make substantial changes or even make the changes that that um, Commissioner Cohen suggested at, at the previous meeting because then it it would be considered just a new a new a application. New, new application. But you could, for example, you could have a motion to reconsider this evening and go through the information and and you could you know you could approve with those conditions if if those were what was the most concerning. You know, it, it actually doesn't say that, Kate. It says if the commission finds there's been a change in facts, it shall thereupon treat the request as a new application received at that time. So it says received at that time. It doesn't say to be heard at such time. And again, I don't think that would give the, the applicant an opportunity to present some modifications as to the architectural issues that would um, considerably improve the chances of passage. Could, could someone summarize uh, whether it's Mark Cade or uh, or the applicant what the uh, change what the new information presented tonight was because I have difficulty identifying it. I thought that's what Mr. Citron just did. No. Well, he well he talked about the the uh, issue of light and air being blocked to the adjacent building, and I thought we had discussed that at, at the. Uh, original uh when the when the project was originally uh, uh reviewed and said that that wasn't something that should or factor into our considerations right so mark in that case we would consider that not new evidence for the purposes of our vote is that, that how we're that's supposed a to go small piece of new evidence I, I do think the application actually contained quite a bit of you know additional photographs on additional subjects, including the neighboring houses, and quite a bit of additional factual material. And I thought that's what Mr. Citron, I think, should have taken us through. That's the, the evidence. Right. And I don't know. I mean, I know personally, having reviewed the packet, um, you know, I, I certainly viewed a, a, a decent amount of new material and new photographs of uh, Chairman Simon. Houses. Yeah. Chairman, my, um, I, I, I recognize that I think the commissioners are, are equally as confused by this process. I served on this commission for six years. I never reached a point where we needed to consider a reconsideration. This is new territory. Um, our understanding after reaching out to both the head of community development and to Cade was that as Cade described, we could not change this application in any way. Our application may not change. However, we can, su we can submit information that would further clarify our original argument. And that's what we've done. We spoke with Cade several times, myself and the project architect assigned to this job. And Cade was very clear that the first order of operation here is for us to say, we have new evidence. We're going to talk about the proportion, the scale of the street, the, real, the, the, the historic value of the adjacent properties and why you should hear our reconsideration evidence before we're able to present it. Mr. Citron rightly outlined why we are here, and we clarified that we do have additional information, which I think, Mr. Simon, you've you've skimmed through and said, yes, there is more information here. Um, but if this is reintroduced, if, if you agree to reconsider this project, we will begin the presentation with the new information. I have queued up the existing application unchanged. If we can negotiate the few changes that Mr. Cohen desired and some and clarify some of those issues, it would be the commission's purview then as a new application to suggest those. But we are not at this point, according to the legal staff and Cade's interpretations of this as we prepared this information, to present any new drawings, sketches, or information relative to the design yet. 
So we have prepared none, but we are willing to discuss the considerations that came up in the last meeting prior to the vote. Yeah, and I, I can confirm that that is what our legal department um, directed me that that first he should just they should generally summarize what new information they have. And then the commission would make a motion to reconsider and then they go into more depth about that information. What do you mean then? After a motion yeah, um, for reconsideration is made seconded and, and approved that then he would go into his, he would present it in detail. That makes sense. That makes sense then. Why okay. Mr. Citron? Yeah, I don't know um, if we can vote on whether there's been a substantial change without seeing the, with the, the presentation made after we've already voted. Right, it, it feels like the additional information that was provided supports the existing design that we already commented on. And that, that is correct. Might, might be right. tweaked in the future. Might be, but we aren't there yet, right? Right. Isn't I think that that's what. Yeah, it's like this. Right. Kate, I'm sorry. Just to clarify, if we approve a it, as a request for reconsideration, they're not allowed to change the design, or we're not allowed to consider those. Well, that that's the why I got the information from our legal counsel that that's why it would be heard the same evening. Is so he's he's contending that there were certain facts that weren't considered. They weren't considered appropriately, uh, you know, maybe they weren't true. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just spitballing on why this is in there. So he would say that generally go into that in more detail, and then it can be reconsidered that same night. And it hasn't been changed previously, other than that, the, the facts changed that led to a denial is what they're contending, if that makes sense. Right. So then it will show that it doesn't yeah, seem to provide. Can I ask? Oh, sorry. I'm going to say it doesn't seem to provide a good format for for the parties to confer and get to an end solution. I mean, so it, I mean, the ordinance itself, which is you know certainly means more than the rules, has the sense that if the commission votes to disapprove the application, they'll be notified. So that's happened, um, and shall be accompanied by recommendations concerning changes um, to the plans. Well, you know, certainly there was, you know, at least that was briefly in the. Um, the, the disapproval. Then it goes on to say the commission shall make reasonable efforts to confer with the applicant, offer technical guidance, and attempt to resolve the differences. The applicant may re resubmit an amended application based upon the recommendations of the commission. So if we follow, if we do not hear this motion or we do not resolve it, but we instead agree that we're going to follow the ordinance itself and um, allow a resubmission and a rehearing at our next meeting. Doesn't that get around all these kind of artificial constraints and, and debates about what we can even approve? Well, I think reconsideration is, is that he doesn't want it to change from what it was previously. And it would be an applicant, not, not necessarily this applicant, contending that the facts weren't, weren't viewed appropriately that when it was denied. I think that's why it exists in the rules. All right, I, well, I guess the applicant made the, um, you know, ask the motion to be considered. So it's it's up to them. But I guess the two choices are: we consider um, solely based on whether there was a change of facts or evidence, and then we could only consider and approve or disapprove based on the plans we already disapproved. Um, can, so can I can I ask a question? Uh, sir, let you, me just let me just I'm finish sorry. the choices, and then I'll let you comment on them. Sure. So it seems to me that the second choice would be that the applicant instead decide to resubmit following um, conferring, you know, continue conferring between the commission and the applicant so they would have a chance to submit a revised plan that had a good chance of approval. I'm sorry, Stuart, those are our two choices. Please go ahead. Okay, the, the question of resubmission has to do with the presentation of new evidence. Mr. Citroen suggested that some of the evidence they wanted to present had to do with uh, other existing houses on the block and in the near vicinity. Can I get Kate or someone to clarify for me that would be a consideration for uh, the standards for new construction? Uh, and it wasn't clear, Mr. Citron, or somebody I think was suggesting that it was evaluated not as an addition to the existing house and the standards for addition, but under the standards for new construction. 
And my memory is that it was evaluated under the standards uh, for an addition, which <clears throat> to the existing house, which clearly it is the minute you physically attach it, uh, which means that evidence or, or examples of houses that had garages that did similar things in the neighborhood wouldn't be applicable, that the referent would really just be the relationship of the proposed design to the existing house. Uh, can we get some clarification on that? Kay, do you remember, or do we have a record? Did anyone talk about it with respect to the uh, standards for new construction? Yeah, we certainly, I mean, the applicable standards are both alteration and um, construction, but in general additions, you know, the standards for, for new construction apply to additions um, more so than the standards for alteration. Am I answering your, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Specifically, uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, the findings of fact stated that alteration standard number one was not met and construction standards two, three, five, eight, and ten were not met. Um, and I would I would agree with you. The discussion and the debate had by the commission was primarily around the standards of alteration, which would have would have I think, in your uh, opinion, referenced the addition and the nature of this as an addition. Uh, however, the findings of fact uh, indicated that the commission's findings were otherwise, and we are prepared this evening to present evidence to toward the argument that this does meet the standards of construction. And I, I would argue that there was, there was little debate relative to those standards, uh, but it was indicated in the findings of facts uh, issued with the denial. All right, um, I guess uh, before I ask the applicant this question, I want to ask commissioners if they have an opinion on it. So um, my um, feeling about what would be best here to reach a solution would be to offer the applicant the opportunity to go under the, um, instead of this motion of consideration, to go under the resubmitting amended application um, pursuant to the ordinance section, whatever this is, E, if the applicant's willing to do that so that there's an opportunity to make some modifications to architectural features that a uh, few of the commissioners um, felt would need to be modified. Um, so do, do other, are other commissioners okay with that before we offer that op um, opportunity? Yes. Yes. That would be fine with me. Yes. Yes. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so I'll ask the um, applicant if they would like, instead of the motion to reconsider, which seems to constrain what they can do, if they would instead, con you know, have ongoing, you know, conferring as they feel they wish to with the commissioners, attempt to resolve dif differences, and resubmit an amended application for next month. W would that be something the uh, applicant would like to do? Um, I I think we would need we'd need a few moments to chat with our client about that. But uh, to be clear, this commission has typically and for decades ahead of this one afforded applicants who needed to make minor corrections to projects the ability to do so in, in, the, in the administrative forum. Um, I was part of that. You guys have all been part of that for several meetings in your in your current status. Um, the reason we pursued the reconsideration as opposed to a full appeal to city council at this point is because we do not want this to take three months to get through. It is now two months into this process for effectively a detached garage in, an, in a district. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know how my client is gonna feel about delaying this another month. We will very likely have missed any opportunity to get into construction in this season anyway. So um, I, I think we'll, we'll put you on mute and I'll make a quick phone call if you'll uh, well, Mark, would, Mark, would you amend your offer so that it was a, an administrative review rather than a review by the uh, commission? I think the, the issues expressed by commissioners were material enough that they voted no on the application. So I think, I, I, you, know, I, I, you know, again, I'd wish it'd been more conciliatory, Gary, and come back and offer to make changes, but you didn't. So we're not going to, I'm personally not going to take responsibility for that. But I, I think 
you know, definitely you should, my preference would be you resubmit an application that you take the advantage of the opportunity to bounce things off people before then. And um, I, I would sure like to get this done and pass for you at the next meeting. So why don't you confer with your client about whether you'd be willing to go. If you'll give us, uh, if you'll give us about five minutes, that'd be great. Thank you. That's fine. Kate, are we, or Mark, are we at a point where we normally would take a break anyway? Yeah, so let's take a five minute break. Till what is it, eight fifty six? Let's let's say um, you want, we'll just, let's say five minutes.
You're I'm sorry, if, every, if everybody who wishes to would come back on, we'll restart now. Okay, so the commission, we're recording again? Yeah, we're all set, Mark. Okay, so I'll let the applicant respond. Um, after some discussion with the client, with our clients and our our counsel, um, the reason that we've asked for this reconsideration this evening, this evening, Chairman, is because starting over with a new application is laborious and time consuming and puts us into the next month. This has been denied, so there is not an opportunity to continue it. It's it's a closed matter. We've asked for the reconsideration to reopen it. Um, we are happy to discuss making the changes. Uh, we are amenable to those. We had mentioned that in the last one. We acknowledged the size of the eyebrow dormer was something we were also of the opinion could be reduced in scale. Uh, we have begun the process of understanding how we can lower that roof a little bit. Uh, we've prepared evidence to show you how that could be done. We've done the math on the depths of these things. We're prepared to reduce that and explain how we would do it. We are happy to work with the commission on that, but we would prefer to do that through a reconsideration this evening so that we can continue forward with this project. All right, well, we'll take one step at a time. Um, let's go back to um, the motion to reconsider then. Would, um, I think the, um, the evidence of change in facts was alluded to by counsel for the applicant, but not shown. Would would commissioners like that evidence shown before voting? Is there any commissioner feels that they need, they need to see that? I mean, I'm not going to take the time unless a commissioner feels that they need that reviewed. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, the evidence was submitted with our request for this motion to reconsider. So it is in front of the commission um, at this point. We were trying to avoid that lengthy process of going through the full presentation um, and if the commission had no intention of even hearing the motion to reconsider. So that is what our basis was. Uh, okay, um, we're required to find in the motion if new, say it again, um, if we've already decided that there's been a substantial change in the facts, evidence, or conditions. Um, Personally, I know I did, I mean, 100% of the time we have applicants take us through the basis for what they're asking for by showing us the basis for it. But if, um, if other commissioners are willing to go um, to vote on the motion and then have the presentation made, personally, I know I reviewed the materials carefully and, and, and don't need it, but I wanna make sure whether any other commissioners feel they need more information um, you know, actually shown to them before voting on the initial motion. Is there any commissioner would like to see more before voting on the motion? No, okay. Um, is there any um, commissioner willing to make a motion for reconsideration? I mean, we're not, we're not, I, th I think, Kay, that we're not required to, I mean, obviously it dies if no one makes a motion. Correct, you're not required to make a motion. Okay, I'll, I'll ask one more, I mean, I can't do it myself. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more time if anybody would like to, you're not required to, no? I'll make a motion, um, can, uh... How, where am I going to read this one off the um, uh, in the agenda there under and, and reference the um, property, the preservation case, um, and the applicable standards are there also. So I can. Uh, do you want me to read the full description as it was originally presented? I think all you have to read is identify the project and then read the basically the sentence that's in. Um, reformat the sentence that's in, um, you know, added in, in uh, lighter type. 
that's all that would be up would be a motion to reconsider, not the description of the work or the standards. Um, okay, well, I'd like to make a motion uh, that we reconsider um, the project at 1217 Michigan Avenue, Lakeshore Historic District, uh, Landmark uh, Preservation 21 Pres 0121. Um, and the last part I should add to that, Mark, is? I think just that it's, the motion is pursuant to Article 4, Section 3 of the Commission Rules. Okay, the, the applicant is requesting reconsideration of a case previously denied for Article 4, Section 3 of the Commission Rules and Procedures. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, Commissioner Driller seconded. Okay, a, a roll call vote again, just on the motion to reconsider. Um, Commissioner Baudin? I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up. Does, does anyone in the commission wish to discuss anything or ask any questions? I just, it's so unusual. I don't wanna cut people I do. Or yes. the vote before they're ready. So our vote is whether or not there's a substantial change in the facts, evidence, or conditions relating to the application. Yes or no to a substantial change. Right. Okay. Anybody else have questions? I, I do have a question. So if we find that there's some credibility to the fact that there wasn't enough discussion initially as to whether or not the applicant wanted to make changes and come back, and that there was some gray area and not a clear um, uh, discussion as to the applicant's wishes prior to us voting. Is that a new fact that would allow us to vote for this reconsideration? Um, you know, the words facts, evidence, or conditions are not so, all that clear. And I to, think you're gonna have to, I, I think that's all there is for us to make a decision to, on it. To be clear, it's, Chairman it's, Simon, it has been our understanding through the city's own legal department. You have two potential motions this evening. The first one is to agree to simply reconsider it. That's a yes or no vote. If you say yes, then we are afforded the opportunity to walk you through the presentation that we've attached relative to the original application. Then to, to Commissioner Jacobs' question, then you are evaluating it again as a new application and you could make suggestions, you could make changes, we could discuss it, it could be continued. Whatever is necessary in that dialogue could happen, but you have two motions as I understand it. The first is to agree to reconsider it. The second is after we've made our presentation, then you can decide whether or not we've made a compelling argument. Uh, Kate, is that, a, is that a correct interpretation? That is the interpretation that our legal department gave me. Yeah, that, that certainly sounds right. So your first motion should be something along the lines of, I move that we reconsider the case 21 Pres 0121. Yeah, I, I think that's basically the, I think that is what's what's been moved. It, it, you know, Correct. In, in those words, I think it's, it's already been moved. Um, and I think we need just to vote on that um, that motion. Um, so, okay, I'm sorry, any other commissioners have just clarifications if the extent that the words are capable of being clarified? Okay, we better vote. Um, come back to Commissioner Bodan. Hi. Um, Commissioner Morris. Hi. Commissioner Jacobs. Hi. Commissioner Cohen. Hi. Commissioner Dreller. Aye. And I'm an aye. Um, so, all right. So the, let's just see what we're, um, I mean, so the, so we're, we're down to the part, the commissioners found that there's been such a change. Um, and to, so therefore we treat the request as a new application. And so I think the presentation should be of the new application. I think you no longer need to um, support the motion we already passed. And so to the extent your materials are, I mean, I, I do think a lot of the new materials you presented are germane to a new application. Um, and, uh, but again, you don't need to, to prove the change in facts anymore. You're free to present it just as if we're any application. 
starting from, from ground zero. Um, Kate, if you could give me the control. I, I have queued up the original application, which is germane to this if we need to reference it, but I will begin, if you will, um, with our new evidence. Um, sorry, yeah. sorry, Gary, you wanted to share your screen. I missed that. Yes, if you'd like. Okay, yep. Yeah. You should be able to. Okay. All right. Um, you should be able to see slide number one before you now. So uh, relative to this slide, when we met last time, we talked about the, uh, the way in which this addition connects to the existing house. Um, because these are not viewable from the public way, we didn't present them before, we are presenting this new evidence today. Uh, because as you can see, this is the Talmadge and Watson addition to the house. This addition, this porch roof is not original to the house. It isn't part of the significant Talmadge and Watson addition. On the front of our house where we have the eyebrow dormer, this is the parapet wall we've connected to. So we've pulled our addition as far to the rear of the house as we can. You can see here the face of our garage relative to the back of the existing house showing uh, what by the National Park Service they define as a modest hyphen of an addition, um, which, would, which would address some of the concerns about the way we have attached this to the existing house. This should be pretty clear in our, in our presentation. We indicated this is a very tenuous connection to the house so that it's not affecting the, the original integrity and fabric of the house. This should also serve to show that this is affecting the existing mass of the house and the existing shape of the house very minimally and could be, according to the Park Service standards and the ordinance, easily removed without disturbing the integrity of the, of the original structure. In this slide, we move a little bit lower again to show you that what we've done is taken this existing roof, uh, which is part of an addition that was done, we believe in the 80s. Um, we've created this and connect, we've connected this to the open port cochere as a breezeway, which makes that a larger open connection to this mudroom entrance. We talked about that a little bit and showed you some, some images of that in the plan and the renderings last time. Um, you can also see that from this bird's eye view, the light, the view through this and the transparency of this really does quite a bit to disconnect this garage structure, the mass of the garage in the back from the main body of the house, keeping it approximately 10 feet or about nine feet eight across this opening. Um, which does put this garage technically in the backyard, although it is still an addition because of this root structure and this breezeway connection to the existing house. Here we come down to birds or to ground level as you leave. One of the things we talked a little bit about in our original presentation was our desire to mimic the roof lines on this house. This again, isn't an original roof line to the house, but it is replicated from the front, which is an original roof line. This, this is an addition done in the eighties uh, that's been since remodeled. So we've taken that sloping roof and that flared shingle detail, which on the main body of the house and throughout the house transitions from shingle siding to copper flashing to asphalt shingle. We've continued that around the back in order to create that cloistered rear yard and to minimize the height and the bulk of this structure. This is the parapet cap that we've talked about from the front of the house as well. So here, what we're showing you is the location of this garage relative to the back of the house. The views we just showed are through here. So you can see that this mass, which is a ladder addition and not noted of any significance in any of the stand, in any of the statements of significance for the house, we're not affecting those. Our roof connection is right here against the side of the existing covered porch and creating a larger connected breezeway through here. Um, to Mr. Cohen's point earlier, we're showing here that the depth of our port cochere or our covered garage extension or breezeway, however we want to, want to discuss this now, we're 17 feet, 17 feet four from the face of the columns to the face of the garage door. The existing depth of that, of that porch, and this doesn't include the overhangs of the eaves on the front is 15 foot six. So we aren't so far off of that. I'll show you a slide in a moment that shows that the average setback between the 15 foot six and the bay here is about 11 foot four. Um, and we'll show that relative to some of the other street, some of the other street frontages in that neighborhood. Um, I'm showing here an additional diagram indicating one of the concerns that, that the commission had, had 
had raised and we didn't fully address. This is the existing line of the driveway as it moves along that, that uh, zero lot line building. We have moved this building to five foot three, which is more than the zoning, which is more than the zoning setback requires, creating a much more uh, a much more green and quiet path between these structures. This is the location of the existing garage. I'm also going to note that in our previous in our previous presentations, we had neglected to show the the two and a half story coach house behind this building, which also which also affects this rear yard space. Uh, one of the reasons we presented this last time and talked about the location of the garage is twofold. One, the depth of the garage off of the street, and also the ability to reclaim some of the sun and some of the light in this backyard. Uh, this building is quite tall. It almost matches the same height as the main house here. And because this is to the south, this does block a significant amount of light. So us by moving this garage forward, we allow this courtyard light from behind the building to the south to enter the backyard and to provide more access in the backyard. Again, these are not things that we thought to bring to the commission in our last meeting, mainly because they're not viewable, they're not visible from the public way. So we're showing you now because they did become a, a part of the conversation. So here are a series of photographs from that backyard. Again, none of these are visible from the public way, but they give you some more context. This is that lot line coach house that exists in the backyard. This is the corner of their building. Uh, in the, in the uh, Preservation Commission's designation of the, uh, of the thematic historic district for apartment buildings, they cite a number of issues, a number of redeeming qualities with regard to this particular building to the south. One of those is, uh, is the, the rear yard courtyards, the rear courtyards and the center courtyards um, being, the, being the way that these buildings are lit and ventilated. Um, this building, was added shortly after the original building. This followed the main building by a couple of years and is also built directly on the lot line. Although from our property, it's set back maybe six feet from the property line, which creates a small courtyard in the corner between this fence, which belongs to our homeowner and the face of that building. Uh, we thought it relevant to show you the, the proximate lot line and the bulk of the buildings along the entirety of that south side of our client's property relative to the discussion of light and air and proximity to adjacent structures. You can see that you can see that garage just coming over the back of this. Our proposal is to move the rear of the, the rear of our proposed garage up to approximately that line. So in this slide we're going to show you a couple of a uh, couple of other things. These are a series of views. Again, none of these are particular views from the public way, but they're, they're relevant to our conversations. We just talked about the proximity to the adjacent structures. This is that rear yard we're trying to open up um, in order to gain not only usable space for this family, but also to allow more light and air into the usable lawn and, and rear yard space. So slide B is standing at that mud room entrance looking due south, which is here. So you can see that this is the ivy covered wall. This is, this is the tree that we've discussed as having been struck by lightning and, and reached a dangerous condition. This is the light well on the existing building. And these are the windows in question. You can, if you notice these windows are, the, this building begins uh, half a flight up roughly. Um, so uh, discussions about basement windows and light and access to basement windows is, is not relevant you can see here that those basement windows, and in this image, these basement windows have all been blocked up. So again, for context, this is the, this is the side of the building. View A, which is the current view through the backyard toward this building, is a grove of, of tall trees and evergreen hedges that were put, that were put in place for privacy many years ago. These, this grove of evergreen is significantly taller than the garage structure we're proposing. So by taking these down to construct the garage and return the, and return our garage roof along the side, we're taking away a lot of this, a lot of this high bulk, which would expose quite a bit of that roof garden that we've proposed on top of the garage to more sunlight. Um, C and E are more specific 
to the side of that building. Here is the, here is the image of the windows we've talked about. Uh, they're very difficult to see. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here, and then there's a small one in the back. Those are the windows most, most immediately affected by, what, by the adjacent garage. Again, our garage is two feet, four inches further off of the property line than the face of the existing garage. Um, we've provided this diagram to support additional information on this. This is the grove of, of tree material that we talked about a moment ago. We're not showing the, the damaged tree because it's going to be removed and it shouldn't be, it, it's not providing, it's not, uh, it's not creating a light or air issue for any of these windows. But this is the relationship of our building relative to the light well, which is inset on the side of the building and the lot line windows that exist on the side of the building. And then the proximity of the coach house in the rear yard, again, on that rear property line. So when we talk about light and air and, and accessibility to the south light, this datum for, for certain is obscured light on this property, therefore making the movement of this garage forward in order to take advantage of as much of this light coming from the south as possible is to the is taking advantage of the site constraints and making better use of this property. Um, for context, these are the windows in that adjacent building. This is the light well that I've shown you pictures of here. So these windows are lot line windows. Um, this is a mirror image of every apartment unit in that building. Typically, this is mirrored about that common party wall. These windows in a typical urban situation are not there. Um, and if another building were to be built there, would be gone. Um, I think Mr. Citron mentioned earlier, and, and we've looked through the zero lot line issues with this. Those windows, should another building be put there, are existing wood windows. They're in existing non-conforming condition. Um, we understand that there's some value, but they do not affect um, and is not your purview, they do not affect the light and ventilation in that unit. As is evidence, there's a bay window, there's kitchen, there are kitchen windows, there are bedroom windows, and there are corridor windows that are unaffected by our proposal. Um, pursuant to what we mentioned earlier, when we talk about the construction standards, um, you've, uh, in your findings of fact, you noted that the construction standards 2, 3, 5, 8, and 10 were not met. And a lot of those have to do with proportions and relationships to the adjacent structures in the neighborhood to which it's visibly, visually related. Um, we think it's important to, to note a couple of things. One, and, and this, is, uh, this goes to some of the discussion last time, there was, a, there was an implication that the existing garage location was original and intentional. Um, we do not believe that's true. We've included a copy of the uh, nomination forms for the thematic, thematic district which talk about how these properties were parceled prior to that building, the building to the south being erected. This property, um, our client's property at 1217, was originally 30 feet further over here, splitting this lot with the house to the north. It is our, it's our contention, and there's no historic data to prove either that the garage was originally located tucked in the back corner behind this building, or over here, but it would stand to reason that the court, that this large side yard would have indeed been the entry point for the barn, the carriages, the garages on that side of the property. When this particular owner built what is now a landmark structure, 30 feet of this property were sold to them, 30 feet of this property were sold, and this owner purchased the entirety of these two lots in order to construct this property. So the history would show that the location of that garage would never have been tucked into that backyard, especially not against that, against that large building uh, with a limited backyard. Uh, we'll also show you in a moment that there is a garden wall for this structure, which is also built on the lot line to the full height of that house, uh, creating a very similar lot line condition along this property line toward the rear of the, toward the, rear of the property. Um, we want to point out that when we, when we proportioned the structure and the size of our addition, we took into consideration the horizontal datums of the existing house, picking up on the porch, which also correspond to 
The peaks of the arches on the main entrances of the building to the north, they pick up on the cornice and the roof line of the building to the south, and the proportional midline of this house on the end. But there's clearly a, there's clearly a horizontal relationship between all these buildings. There's a hierarchy established between the open courtyard, the open porches, and our proposed open uh, port cochere in the distance. There's a hierarchy established between our house with a small dormer, with a large dormer, with a small arch, with a large arch. So we think it, we think it's important to, to note that the height, the height of this structure, which we have, again, as I mentioned in the back, this curved roof, this curved roof on the porch comes up to meet the shingled siding here, which is exactly what we've done here in order to continue visually the horizontal datum of that sloped roof, which is an original detail to the house, which then corresponds with what perhaps was a datum picked up by this building when it was designed and constructed, but certainly picks up on the horizontal datum of this of the house further to the north, which would have been contemporary with the house that, that we're making the alteration to. So we would, we would like the commission to understand that there has, been, there has been significant thought gone, thought put into the proportion and the way that we've laid out the sizes and visual relationships of this structure in the distance to the openings and the rhythms of the rest of the block. Here's a photograph of that condition. Here is that low house. You can see that recessed courtyard. This is a brick wall toward the front. So the proportion of this opening to the proportion of our garage. Also, when we talk about the rhythm of the structures and the spacing on the street, this is a high building, roughly the same ridge height, a little bit shorter than ours, that drops down to a low flat structure in between. This is a high ridge structure that drops down to a low slung structure here that then comes back up. So we feel that our, the rhythm that we've established with this garage and with its location is also in keeping with the natural rhythm of this street. Uh, the distance with which we've set this back is also in keeping with, with the setbacks between the plate glass living room windows and the forward face of this building. You'll also notice that when this, when this modern building was constructed, there is a, there is a concrete or there is a there is a brick garden wall that runs from lot line to lot line on the front face of this. So also, and as evidenced by this building, there is a tendency on this block to go from lot line to lot line, lot line to lot line. We are, we are maintaining our five foot setbacks, but the rhythm on this street as you move through is a full, is a full occupation of these front, of these front lot lines and these front facades with the architectural integrity of these structures. So again, we're showing here, this is that, this is the wall coming forward. This is this punched back. This is the rhythm, low to low, high to high, and then the building on the far end. So in this particular drawing, what we're showing you is that again, the front of this courtyard wall, the garden wall runs down the side. So this is a zero lot line condition uh, for our homeowner. This is a zero lot line condition for our homeowner. This is a maintained setback. This is a maintained setback. You can see here that these garages also attached and very proximate to the, to the property line, the distance from here to here, the distance from here to here. These things are rhythmically in keeping with this block. We're not, we're not proposing to put, put a garage in a, in a location that's dissimilar from the other, the other garages and the other rhythms on this, on this block. Um, I mentioned earlier, this is, this is the average porch setback, 15, 6, 9, 10, 7, 11, which averages to 11 foot 11. We're at, we're, we're proposing 17 foot four. And to be quite honest, that has everything to do with us trying to make the same pitch and slope of this roof line up with the, with the alignment that we've shown you across here. Okay. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit for, for a moment, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the context and some of the precedent in the neighborhood. Um, we've got a series of slides that show specific houses that we think are relevant to this conversation. And, and then the dots represent a series of houses that I think, uh, I think are, worth, are worth noting are not dissimilar. Um, 
this was mentioned in the last one. We were unaware of this. Um, I think this is a good example of this. This is a significant garage structure that's been pulled forward. It's directly across the street. Again, the massing and the and the street wall that's created between the continuous the, con the continuous fence, the gable end, the fence, and the connection to this house, and the rhythm of higher to lower is not dissimilar from what we're proposing. Uh, this was a project recently recently approved by the commission and currently under construction. That was an extension of a similarly roofed shape, similarly roofed garage addition and extension. While stylistically and historically not in keeping with the same project, we think it is of note that an extension of these roof lines and a, and a continuation of some of the significant architectural details is certainly been was certainly found to be acceptable and successful in this application of the standards. This is an existing project that incorporates a breezeway, a similarly roofed structure, copying the roof shapes. This brings, a, this brings the garage far forward and makes a much, much more uh, aggressive street presence. We don't think this is the right solution for our property, but the connection, the physical connection of a breezeway to the garage is important. And this is, this is right down the street. This is less than half a block to the south. Um, this we believe is an original garage we've attached to this package, the copy of the statement of significance on this as well. Uh, but we feel that the, that the use of the roof forms and the adherence to these things in this example is also why it's important that we, that we continue to do that with the addition that we're proposing. Um, this is a house um, uh, diagonally on the corner. Um, this is a very significant shingle style house. Um, I had the good fortune of working on this house with Mr. Cohen when I worked for his office. Um, this has two additions on it. It has, well, we, we suspect that the, the pork cochere is, is likely original to the house, uh, but also in keeping with the, with the rhythm that we've proposed, the main house in the gable, and then the shape of the pork cochere with a matching but diminutive gable addition off to the side. Um, when you look at this, when you look at this house, this house also has a, a tenuously connected garage. The deck on this house connects the garage physically and the addition on the back of this, which also takes the roof shapes, the roof forms, the roof curves, minimizes them off of the main, off the main body of the house, and then creates an addition appendage that is open and spatial in order to see through it and is also indicative of the details that came off of this. We're following suit by using the same details, the same open nature, trying to make this garage, port cochere, breezeway connection as transparent and as open as we can. We think these are beautiful. They are inspirational. We think that the shingle style house that we are working on is just as unique and would deserve a similar uh, addition and, and ability to create that port cochere addition. And in this case, screen porch. Um, this is a house on the far south block, also a significant shingle style home. There, this is a difficult image to see. Uh, we did take all of our photographs in the public way, uh, but there is a port cochere here that is lined up with a garage directly in the back. Again, minimizing the shape. The roof shape of this is similar to the gable ends. It is diminutive. It is stepping down. It is subordinate to the main body of the house. Uh, we think that there is a precedent with these houses. Um, Two of the last, probably the last three that we showed you are original context, uh, very likely original construction, um, which, would, which would indicate that there is a historic precedent, there is an original precedent, and we're not attempting to do something that is dissimilar um, from the structure or from what would have been done to a shingle file house of that particular period. Um, again, a series of photographs, not, not with the implication that these are are examples of how we would like to execute an attached garage, but these are all houses within very short walking distance directly across the street, for example, at the end of the block. These are all attached garages, um, some with large overhead additions, some with small ones, um, but showing that the, the precedent for an attached garage in this neighborhood um, is a strong one. Uh, this is, uh, with the exception of the uh, modern house directly Decided, I believe, the only detached garage uh, uh, on this side of the street and of this scale. So uh, we think that it's not dissimilar in it, and it is in keeping with the scale and the proportion and the rhythm 
of the adjacent structures and of the community, of the neighborhood there. So, and that that's the bulk of the the material that we've that we've prepared for this evening. Um, I'm happy to pull up the previous application document if you feel like you need to see any of that. But um, I would say that now that this is being considered as a new application, um, we do not disagree that the dormer on the garage should be modified. We've begun to think about how to make that smaller and how to proportion that a little bit better. Uh, we think it's an important architectural feature of our project. We, we certainly want to keep it and integrate it, but we do agree that it could be it could certainly be fine tuned. Um, reducing the depth of the port cashier, um, which I think was a was a concern of Mr. Cohen's. Um, our our concern with that is making is making the slope on the front of the structure match. Bear with me for one moment. Match the data we're picking up here. I think if we shrink this, we lower that, and we shorten the we shorten the depth of this a little bit. I think we can probably uh, we can accommodate all of those requirements, uh, but we want to do so in a way that maintains the proportions and the integrity of the detail with, that we're trying to maintain on the house. Um, so, in short, we have no opposition. We're, we're not opposed to making any of those changes that were suggested in the last discussion. All right. Questions from commissioners? No. Uh, Gary, I, you know, maybe my memory is totally failing. I think you're to be complimented on a wonderful presentation of a whole set of issues were, which were not raised as issues at the last meeting, to the best of my memory. Uh, I think that uh, the argument you've made for how you got to where you got to uh, makes perfect sense and the precedents that you're showing are fine. I don't remember the, the nature of the attachment or the pulling forward of the garage were anything that any of the commissioners actually objected to. I think the only comments were about the scale of the dormer, which you said you want to address. And then uh, I, you know, Every time I go by the site, there are like three or four cars parked there. And I understand that the depth of that porch is not to match the or relate to the porch on the front, which is what you had originally told the commissioners, but is to actually form a carport for a few more cars that the owners have parked there. Um, I think it personally, and maybe it's a matter of taste that it it would be better and have a better relationship to the house if it were closer to uh, that 11 foot or even the nine foot 10 uh, dimension, because uh, the porch seems to go from 15, six to nine, 10 to seven, one. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that would not be a sticking point for me. So, you know, if you're, uh, I, I would make a motion, and I don't have all of the stuff in front of me, but uh, you know, I would be fine with a motion that asks you to address those things and to come back uh, administratively at, for your final approval. I would like to um, just help you a little bit, uh, Stuart, because um, you were saying that you didn't remember. Um, I just wanted to note that I actually did object to having pulled the um, garage forward and connecting it so far forward. Um, but, right. but, but um, I did also say at that time, or I think I did, that um, I didn't understand why it had to be. Um, that didn't seem to follow the expectation of the standard that it be minimal. But the new presentation, which I think was a good one um, and very helpful, uh, explained to me why moving the garage forward was um, something that, um, you know, had some value other than just bringing it, bringing it forward just because. So that makes sense to me. I want to be on the record in case I wasn't clear last time that I, I actually do not object to the design of the garage. For me, it was the location. Last time. Um, are there 
my, my recollection was the the stated objections in the um, findings were all about specific architectural features, um, or there were a number of architectural features. I just want to make sure if any commissioners, any other architectural features they wanted to discuss that we get that out on the table now so it could be part of a motion. No, I don't have anything um, besides the ones that had already been mentioned. Um, I appreciate the, the, the new slides in the presentation. Um, it helps me understand some of the choices that were made. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you all, that you placed the garage, um, what was it, five foot three, away from the apartment building next to it. Um, I just have to ask though, just to put this out there, is there an opportunity to slide it even further north um, just to give as much space between the existing apartment building and the location of that new garage and allow more light, more breeze between the two structures? Is that even an option? Um, that, to be quite honest, that is the code minimum width for that garage right now. So, um, of the garage. Yeah, that's that's as that's as narrow as we can make a two car garage uh, mm -hmm. viable. So. And you um, don't want to scoot it up because it's on the corner to corner. Well, then scoot it, bring the garage forward. Uh, excuse me, north. Because uh, then it, it's it is right it is on the side of the house if we bring it north then you then we have to demolish the back uh the back corner of the house somehow but well, the porch overhang you'd have to demolish no the, the, the this is the this is the north wall of the garage which is coplanar with the north wall of the existing house so if i move the garage north this way mm -hmm. we're, we're not seeing your oh, screen yes, we're not see seeing sorry. The, Kate, there's no you see that? Wrong page sorry about that I didn't realize I had done that. Um, um, you had it. Uh, I, where to go? Where to go? That one. Oh. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So the, oh, we're yeah. co-planar with the side of the house now. So as I said, that that is as small as we can build that garage. We're using two by four studs. We're using absolute minimums to get cars in there. Um, you know, the the portal frame to build the front face of this thing is going to be something of a structural miracle, um, but. We're, we're doing everything we can to squeeze every inch out of that south side. Um, and, it, and it's a moot discussion because they're meeting the requirements of the law, yeah. of the zoning ordinance. I can ask if there's they have, they have every right to put the garage there. What, and I can ask if there's what you're suggesting is that they would overlap, they would overlap the house. I understand that now, but that's what my question was asking. And, and what those implications would be, right? Good question. Um, okay, why don't we, um, we'll, we'll come back to commissioners, but uh, a number of members of the public, a number of members of the public were signed up to speak and uh, we'll again go off the list of people who signed up. Um, and, and I'd ask that uh, two things, that you limit your comments to two minutes and that um, you discuss issues that the Preservation Commission has the ability to decide. Um, and so, Kay, do you want to call the name of the first person and we'll ask everybody to introduce themselves who's speaking? Yes, there were two signed up. Um, the first was Polly Nandito. So I'm Polly. I'm the neighbor on the first floor, 1213-1. Could you um, say sorry, state your full name? Polly Nandico. Thank you. And I live at 1213 Apartment 1. I, I could assure you that I could see out of all my windows, despite there being some ivy evident, but I have a clear view. Um, my, my view and is I have no concern with the neighbor's yard. You know, I have criticism of the yard. I, it's not at all the, the concern. It's light, it's the air, it's the space, it's considerate. <laughs> um, and um, those are my, my main concerns. Um, and, you know, I've expressed this and, you know, that there's discussion about, you know, the resale value of their home. Like, I really hope that this isn't done and then they sell their home. That would be painful. 
you know, this is, you know, I've been here for 15 years. This is where I, you know, will have my grandchildren. Visit. Or it was where I was to have my grandchildren visit, but it's, um, it is not nothing. I have a third of the windows in my home now obstructed by a garage wall. It's really expensive. That's my view. Did, did the plan that um, Gary Schumacher showed describe your unit? Are those windows only in the hallway? So they are in the hallway. Um, and, you know, those are the four largest of the 14 windows in my home. So, yeah, I mean, it's not only in the hallway. I mean, the, our, this all, this is a, entirely a hallway, you know, it's one of these train <laughs> buildings. So, yeah, about a third of my apartment is a hallway. And, you know, that I open my bedroom door, there's the hallway. My kids open their door, the hallway, the kitchen, the hallway. It is my, the third of my, my unit. And that light, I mean, it's, yeah, it's uh, yeah, no windows anymore there. Um, be pretty bad. And, you know, I, I just can't imagine or even contemplating imposing that on somebody and then living next door to them. It's very, yeah. <laughs> that's my feeling. So, and, you know, I've been there for 15 years. You know, I purchased this place before the neighbors moved in. Steve upstairs is here for 25 years, you know, and, you know, it's, I think the neighbors knew, you know, what they were purchasing and, you know, it would it just affect another is just not something I, it's not in my comprehension as a human being. I really, yeah, it's not the way I roll. So. Okay, do you want to call the next person? Uh, yeah, the next and last speaker is uh, Mr. Stephen Denenberg. Yes. Hi, and my name is Stephen Denenberg. I live at 1213 Michigan and on third floor. Uh, you know, I, I've written a couple of different pieces of comment on this, and I, I was very pleased with the decision of the commission uh, at the last meeting. And I thought that mainly the objections that were raised and that were the reasons for the vote were the effect of this structure on the architecture of the, of the area, uh, of the rhythm of the street, uh, that this is a very dramatic change. This is, uh, this is a, uh, a space, a relationship of buildings and space that's been there for 119 years. Uh, and I think you know, that should be something to consider. If this is the point is historical preservation, uh, that's a, an entity itself. That is, a, that is something there uh, that you can't duplicate. And making the equivalences with other uh, homes in the area and uh, other garages, I don't think is uh, quite appropriate because again, this is a very singular spot. Uh, it, it's, I think if you if you look at that one slide, which is a, a, a panorama of the 1200 block of Michigan, and actually just visualize this uh, this garage being set in there, I think you'd see that it really upsets the entire balance, and and indeed it it upsets the flow uh, through there. There's been a, a space there for 119 years. There's been a flow of energy and air up and back. There've been neighbors on both sides for all that time. But I, I think it's worth considering that this is something that should be a space that should be preserved. And, uh, you know, we don't deny the, our neighbors, they can build their, their deck and the pool and that's all fine. They can redo the garage, but we do think it should be set back. It should be further back, back towards where the location of the current garage is. 
And I understand that will upset some things and you'll have to reconfigure some things and perhaps do some walkways because they want a, some protection from the elements. But I think it's feasible and I think it's something that should be considered. Um, then I guess lastly, I just would like to say that, correct something that uh, the windows on the basement were not board, uh, bricked up long ago. They were done actually last year they were done in relation in, in, in regard for some uh, wishes of the neighbors at 1217 Michigan. Uh, and we did go to the Historical Preservation Commission, permission to do it because it is a landmark building and anything that happens to it is, is purview of the commission. And I think setting this garage down immediately next to it is something that really should be considered again. And I don't think it's a proper uh, or uh, appropriate design. Thank you. Okay. Um, would any commissioners like to um, raise any additional issues or discussion points? No. Um, okay. Um, so in terms of uh, potential motion, it, it sounded like the only um, the only qualification I heard was um, a reduction of the scale of the dormer on the garage and um, that that would come back as an administrative matter um, you know, to be approved um, without another hearing. Um, it, were there any other points that any commissioners wanted included in the motion? Um, so do you want to try to make that motion? If it, um, if yeah, it, Kane, can I, can you put the, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, thing on the screen so I can read it off? There you go. Yeah, I printed it out before I left the office and uh, I left it. <laughs> I was supposed to go in the bag with my laptop, but it didn't make it there. Uh, I think I the wrong way. Here, let's... Um... Oh, I just need the description in the agenda. No, I understand. Let's. Yeah, sorry about that. I thought it was closer. I forgot that this whole National Register nomination was tucked in here. Uh, here you go. Okay. Um, I make a motion that we approve for a certificate of appropriateness the. Uh, uh, two car frame garage addition to uh, 1217 Michigan Avenue, uh, uh, landmark preservation 21 Pres 0121, uh, with uh, the architect's uh, reconsideration of the scale of the uh, of the open eyebrow window over the uh, Port Cochere connection. Uh, applicable standards, demolition one through five, alteration one through 10, construction one through eight and 10 through 15. Uh, and that uh, the uh, uh, adjustments to the design be reviewed administratively. Um, okay, so just, just to clarify, it just wasn't clear that we're requiring them to modify um, the size of the eyebrow dormer, but they would could that could be done administratively. It's a requirement, not an option, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, what about what about the depth of the? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, the architect said that there were a few things that they were reconsidering. It was one of them the depth of the uh, of the covered portion in yes, front. We, we will adjust the size of the dormer and without disturbing the the integrity of the detail we're trying to replicate, we will shorten that port cochere as much as we can. Okay, I, uh, I, I, under, I understand that you want the back wall of the uh, of the roof garden to align with the with the that's right. with the uh, east wall of the house, and that that's setting up the geometries. Okay, right. so both of those uh, are part of the. Uh, proposal. Sorry to have mucked that up so much, Mark. <laughs> it's fine. You also want to note the new windows and the, the other part of the project? 
Three uh, non-original vinyl and demos, all that. Oh, the, yeah, there's, sorry, uh, and we approve the replacement of three non-original vinyl windows on the north and south elevations, attic and basement levels, and the replacement of vinyl siding on the north and south elevations with wood clapboard siding and the replacement of the existing window trim to match the original conditions and construct uh, a new permeable uh, concrete driveway. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, a second? Second. Um, all right, a roll call vote. Um, Commissioner Baudin? Aye. Commissioner Morris? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Cohen? Aye. Commissioner Dreller? Aye. And I'm an aye. So, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chairman Simon, um, there was a, a little bit of confusion. I believe the other motion you need to make is uh, for a recommendation for a minor zoning variation. If you remember, um, we were reducing the, uh, the existing non-conforming lot coverage by two and a half percent. It's part of the uh, application, but we'll need a recommendation uh, to go to the zoning, to go for the minor zoning variation on this as well. Um, that, that wasn't part of our... It, 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 I thought it, it was just major zoning. Yeah, it, 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 it is, Gary. It's just major. This, it's just, is, um, this is a determination both from our a, lot of You don't need it for the minor? No, you don't need it okay. for minor. It's pretty, it's pretty explicit in the in the ordinance. Okay. Um, there's some confusion in the zoning code, but there you go. The, that the preservation ordinance overrules it. So got it. Okay. Never mind then. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, the hearings end. Um, the commissioner is going to go on to minutes and staff reports. I guess I, I, I'd ask as a courtesy that everybody else, um, other than commissioner, sign off. There'll be no further discussions of any of the matters for tonight. It was totally ridiculous. It was just like they made you go through it just to. Wow, that's a beautiful thing to have on camera. <laughs> um, you know, the, the response I would make to that, uh, and I would like Kate to check the, uh, the record of the meeting with Gary uh, and the Nichols, uh, sorry, is that the name of the client? Yeah, I Nichols. would like the record checked because I'm not sure why we voted uh, the proposal down rather than the continuance. And my memory, and I know I've got people listening, but I think I got that, or the, the commissioners got that impression that, that the architect wanted a determination then and now and put that forward in a rather aggressive way. And well, I would just like um, to know if that's a correct memory or not. Well, that's what I'll say to that. And I think it's very appropriate as we move into approval of the minutes is let's not approve the minutes until the video is made available and I can give you a more accurate. Thank you. There you go. I think that's a good idea, Kane. All right. If we could ask the other members of the public to sign off, please. Um, who is iPhone for? Or is that four people? Are you able to nudge someone off? All right. Well, I think. Um... Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, the public is allowed to stay, right? I'm just to clarify. Even if the public doesn't stay, um, the video will be available, and so we should certainly only say appropriate things. We would be content of the public here. And there are people who watch the tapes. And in, incorrect, was, Sarah. Was that an admonition for me <laughs> about only saying appropriate things? No, I, would, I was asking, uh, they are allowed to stay, right? We yes. They're yeah. allowed, yeah, they're allowed to stay. I don't, I don't see any issue with asking. It makes it really difficult sometimes with a lot of participants to have discussion when you're not sharing the screen, but they are allowed to stay. Um, okay. Uh, minutes, I think we'll hold on that. I'll bring them back. Um, 
to the follow meeting. And that brings us to staff reports, which um, I think the first one is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carlos, is it the awards first? I guess I can check for myself. Yeah, it is. It Here we is. go. I'm looking at it right now. Um, so, good evening, uh, commissioners. Carlos, I can barely hear you. Yeah, can you can't hear you. Turn your volume up a little. Is that is better? Not. It's about the same. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I'm using my phone. I don't have. Um, I can call back or something if that would be better. Or I, can, or I can try to go through it, Carlos. Why don't you go, if they don't hear me, that's fine. Go ahead, Kate. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just mention, I guess, first, the design awards were held, I think this was maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, and I'll start by saying that it was kind of a combination. We canceled it in 2020. So um, we had a pretty decent turnout. I think we had 12 total. Um, nominations that came in. Um, surprisingly, and compared to other years, we didn't have any Northwestern projects, and they usually they usually kind of dominate the, the submissions. Um, so we have, which is typical, a jury of three individuals. Um, Doug Carr is a, now he's a consultant planner um, for a firm in Chicago, but prior to that, he worked for um, multiple municipalities across Illinois. Most notably, he was the uh, preservation officer Officer for Oak Park for, for many years. Um, Anne McGuire, who's a former um, commissioner on the Preservation Commission, um, Evanston resident and um, architect. And then Marisa Schulz, who is um, urban designer, urban planner, Evanston resident, um, who started her own firm recently called All Together Studio. It's a planning consulting group. Um, and so we went out and toured the, the various sites and below are the award winners. I think um, we'll have a publication in the newsletter the city sends out and something on the website as well. And then um, the intention is a year where we can host something in person that we'll do so and bring back um, these members in addition to um, the new recipients. So. Uh, 2735 Sheridan Road. This is an interesting case as it relates to our previous um, discussion at the last meeting. So this is an accessibility project, this addition here um, to house an elevator. It's very front facing compared to the last one, but it, it was very well done. Um, so this won an award for sensitive addition and alteration. Um, everyone I think is familiar with, with this maybe not that we have a few new commissioners, but 2404 Ridge um, won an award for adaptive use. Um, it was a previous barn structure. It's now um, adapted for, for residential use. Uh, 2235 Sherman, this also won an award for proper rehab and restoration. So uh, multiple nominees can, can win in the same category. Uh, this house, came before the commission maybe in December, I think, of this last year. It was a, a pretty terrible fire that gutted the interior and um, affected quite a bit of the, the exterior. The home was uh, very briefly proposed for demolition and then it was purchased and rehabbed by um, a company called Property Catalyst that does uh, work out of Glenview, I think, primarily. And they did a very nice job, in, including a complete rebuild of some of the art glass windows that, that melted um, during the fire. 1620 Judson, I think this is a commission project from three years ago. This is a Paul Janicki project. It's a, a small um, addition here in the rear of the home, um, visible from the alley that we thought was well done. It won an award for sensitive addition and alteration. They also uh, completely restored their windows um, on all elevations, which is relevant to our discussion today. This one was interesting. This was uh, started out as a, a violation of the ordinance. This is a um, what some people might remember as the fishbowl on Dempster, the goldfish bowl. Um, a really bad. Uh, a previous tenant came in and put in, ripped out the historic doors and put in like a Home Depot version with with boarded up um, side lights and and 
so they came in and, and they mimicked the existing doors. Um, there's only one set of historic doors on this building now. It's kind of an amalgam of like different doors and windows right now. Um, they did a nice job. I think this is a nice um, inclusion for sometimes the smaller interventions have, have a big impact as well as, as the bigger ones. Uh, 1500 Sherman, the Albion project, this won an award for appropriate new construction. Um, so it's not preservation related. These are also preservation and, and design awards, but um, it is a very unique building if you haven't had the opportunity to, to drive by or walk by. Um, that first first level kind of extru extrusion that mimics, uh, you know, the two and three part commercial buildings. Um, and then that it's kind of like curved, canted residential above. It is quite an interesting structure. And I think the last one, this was actually, I think maybe the, the favorite of the jurors, 1322 Lake Street. It's a, it's a small one car garage in the Ridge Historic District won an award for appropriate new construction. Um, I think some of their comments at the time was it was just a really, it was a nice example of how to break down the massing of a typical garage um, into smaller components that, that fit better within a district. And that's it. So congratulations to all the winners. Um, and we hope to celebrate in the near future with them. That's self-nominated? Some of the some of them are self-nominated. There's a few, um, for example, that one on Sherman. Um, city staff nominated that. I mean, that was a potential demolition of a landmark home that they rehabbed. Um, and then also the that um, storefront door on Dempster. City staff nominated that as well. And I don't know if we lost Carlos, but the next. Yep. Can you can you hear us, Carlos? I can, but I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry. Barely. Yeah, I don't know what's the problem, but uh, I said earlier that commissioners also are welcome to nominate buildings in the future. Mm -hmm. We did been asked in the past to do the same. Well, maybe I missed the, the deadline for doing that. I'm not sure I would have since I'm so new. Um, yeah, I didn't know about the deadline either. Okay, that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> well, the projects have to be no more than five years old. So if you have any project in mind, uh, we can accommodate next year. In general, what is the timing for nominations? Uh, we moved it from um, preservation month in May uh, to September mainly because over the years I hear from architects and applicants that it's very difficult to take pictures um, at the, in the early spring. So they prefer to take pictures afterwards. <laughs> so they want to highlight their projects the best they can. So yeah. we just moved. And the other thing is the, the pandemic. <laughs> that was yeah. another thing that we, we had to cancel it. And um, it was very difficult to be honest, to get nominations. So eventually huh. we got 11 nominations, no, 12 nominations, one was withdrawn, but it, it was, you know, a good number of nominations compared to oh. perhaps other years. Yeah, I totally missed, didn't know it was happening. Uh, we did in addition to a uh, uh, Dwight Perkins house uh, on Lincoln that the owner would have uh, nominated. Uh, Next still, year. Like I said, you, Next you year. Have time. Not a problem. <laughs> We still have time. <laughs> Just let me know when the deadline is. Uh, we will. We will let you know. Uh, Thank of, you. Yeah. Carlos, do you want me to run through design guidelines really quickly? I think it would be best because if you don't hear me well, I I, I think that would be better if you can go through. Um, sure. Um, so this is somewhat similar to what we did last time. Uh, we're trying to create or formalize. Um, some more, um, I don't know what the best way. Uh, first, they'd be illustrated, which I think is always a benefit for guidelines. And then they'd be more comprehensive. I, I would say that the current guidelines the commission has, they really act more as like a series of kind of value statements than they do what traditional um, design guidelines are for historic districts. Um, so we are asking essentially for 
um, two or three commissioners who would be willing to um, participate in, in drafting this document and working with staff um, to review various drafts. Um, and we do have a more, it's not included in the packet, but a, a really a more detailed outline um, that follows what's kind of um, the best practice for, for creating a set of guidelines. And it, it really revolves around, uh, let's see, Around one is just exterior maintenance. I mean, this there are guidelines for everything for you know proper cleaning techniques, proper painting, um, proper ways to repoint a building, everything as small as that, all the way to a new construction, construction of additions. Um, it would deal with different materials, their appropriateness, their application. Um, so it, it's pretty comprehensive. The idea is that the guidelines are not subjective. Um, the standards within the ordinance are inherently somewhat subjective, but the guidelines themselves are not supposed to be. They're supposed to be fairly objective and clear cut and easy to understand. And they're a tool not only for the commission to utilize when they make decisions, but maybe more um, importantly, it's for, for homeowners and architects and contractors to have a, a resource and a guide to better understand what are the preferred treatment types when they do work in Evanston? And then inherently, if they follow those preferred treatment types, they would be meeting the standards most likely. Um, and great. so I don't know. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that's great to keep um, homeowners or potential homeowners and their point of view in mind as, as these are being uh, revised. Great, great idea. I think the, the illustrations would help with that too, potentially you know, help the homeowners understand a little bit more. Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. And I always, I always say that we're, you know, we're our own best laboratory of sorts. So really um, the other thing, in addition to more kind of schematic massing drawings that a lot of guidelines are, is just photos of what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and that those come from Evanston projects because they're all over what not to do and what to do. <laughs> yeah, the do's and don'ts are always helpful. Mm -hmm. If you can hear me, I, I think where staff is asking to form this subcommittee to assist staff uh, with the writing of the guidelines, and uh, we'll be looking forward to do that. Um, and we will uh, report periodically with the progress we're making until they're completed and adopted by the commission for their use. Kate, I have a question. Uh, in terms of specificity of something like this. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it also would uh, uh, relate to uh, the contributions of the commissioners and our various backgrounds. But for instance, uh, you know, if you wanted what was essentially a masonry restoration spec, uh, I know I couldn't produce that for you. I can't speak for John. And I think right now we're currently the only two architects on the commission or, or really, uh, I don't know whether that's something that any of the other commissioners would address, but uh, would you consider actually going to um, people who restore wood windows, people who do mason, specifically masonry restoration and bringing them in um, somehow as consultants? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, when I've done this in the past, we've created um, somewhat of like a steering committee um, and it's made up of some of these different experts. For example, a, a window restoration is, is an obvious one. Um, it's very specialized work. Um, so yeah, we could certainly do that. Again, there's a lot of really qualified, excellent contractors in Evanston that I'm sure would be willing to, to participate. I just want to remind you that Susie and I are also registered. Yes, I was going to say, there's a few yeah. more. Than... I, I have a question um, and it's about the standard that has to do with innovation. Um, so I, I feel like we need to make sure that we're not discouraging innovation. So is that going to be addressed in the design guidelines? Boy, that's a toughie. What's innovation? What constitutes innovation? Right. Right. And, what, and think back to our discussion uh, about the, uh, was it a six flat? Where mm -hmm. 
you know, where they wanted to change all the windows and add solar right. panels. Um, is that innovation? Yeah, that I, that is actually what I was I was going to say that, but then we continued it anyway. Um, but um, I, I I was I was thinking about innovation a lot when we I was looking at this packet this week and or this month. I, th I think you know that standard to me is there because it allows the commission to constantly be receptive to evolving treatment types and techniques that exist. So you you always have the possibility to review a case and say, you know, wow, what you're doing is is really innovative because it's like Stuart said, it's just constantly moving target basically. Um, so that's at least how I've interpreted that standard is it allows you to re review projects and, and make a determination whether they're innovative or not. Um, but certainly it's something that we can help pinpoint or have some guidelines that might come in to play more with like some revised, you know, value statements or goals of the, of the guidelines themselves. I mean, I think design guidelines is a great idea, exactly as you've described it, having some of the commissioners involved, all that stuff. But I wouldn't want to have it be so um, definitive, the design guidelines that we discourage innovation. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. So just to make sure that there's some play or kind mm -hmm. of, of yeah and and it's usually it they're usually much less specific than i think maybe you're thinking design guidelines are i think a really good example if i can think of the best example out there it's probably the city of san antonio has a set of design guidelines that are really excellent um and it, we could look at them sometime or i can send them to you but they're they're not like example it's not a it's not a detailed drawing or a spec sheet of you know exactly how you have to do something it's more of a yeah no i've i've seen design guidelines yeah. and i've i've helped review them and stuff um but i i guess if we're talking about helping homeowners kind of be inspired i want to make sure that we that it's clear somehow in these design guidelines that this isn't sort of the edges of what they can do mm -hmm. um i mean i i with with respect to the, and I, I just wanted to finish up the thought about innovation because, oh, yeah. you know, I, I don't consider, uh, you know, somebody out there trying to make architectural forms that nobody's ever seen before innovation. And I was frankly delighted when Nate Kipnis had an aha moment and said, gee, I wonder if there is a way to take and restore a historic window and make it energy efficient so that it is, you know, operating at the same level as a as a brand new, uh, uh, you know, contemporary window. And that's arguably more innovative. That's than innovation. More yeah. More than yeah, replacing more. it. Right. Yeah. Right. What could you do to this window? Right. To to keep it from leaking air. Right. To, you know, to, to give it the same R factor. Yeah. So and I just had a lot of testing going on right now to, to figure that out right now. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I think that design guidelines can be done in that way, but I just wanted to be on the record as, you know, um, not wanting to make homeowners feel like that's, those are their only choices, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. So, so, Kate, what do you want to do to um, take volunteers? How do you want to? Yeah, and, and we don't even have to do it now if nobody wants to volunteer now, but um, we eventually would like to have, yeah, two or three that would be willing to to really first look at, I think, a draft of the, the outline that we've prepared and then um, to look at drafts of the guidelines themselves and help write them. Eight, I'm always happy to be involved in stuff like that. So, great. And there's two others that aren't on the call that may be interested too. So, if it's not too con time consuming, I can volunteer. I have actually written design guidelines for the Department of the Defense. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and then the only other staff report it's not even really a report so much but i did want to mention that the subcommittee we created last time i did send out um kind of the first 
the first, um, I don't want to call it an assignment necessarily, but it's kind of like homework. Um, and, and so- uh, Idea gener generation yeah. works, worksheet. Yeah. Um, so that is out there and we are working and we will um, have something to prepare in the near future and come back to the, the full commission with. I thought that was really great. Thank you, Cade, for doing that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's the fun, that's the fun stuff. <laughs> Good. All right. Any anything else to do with the meeting? Good. Someone like would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? I move we are uh, we adjourn the meeting. I second. All right. We'll we'll do a voice vote for this one. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. All right. See you guys next month. Thanks, everybody. Hey. Thank Good you. night. Good night. Good night.